This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. Yes, come to daddy, as they say. Uh, what? Who says that? Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Card Show. It's a Friday morning, so you never know what's going to happen. That guy right there is David Jacoby. All right, yeah. Jacoby. Hey. Still David Jacoby. And, of course, right here, Mr. Super Bowl oh champion, my main man, Mr. Willie Anthony Aloysius oh, McDonald. Really? Cologne McDonald. right there. And we have a great show for you today. Believe it or not, shockingly, uh, tons of football. In today's show, even even maybe possibly a little nod to the Dallas Cowboys oh. could happen in today's show. But the tournament is the tournament is the tournament. This is the time of year where every guy pretends like he follows college basketball <laughs> all year long. He knows all the players in every team. But here's the reality. Yesterday, of course, there's a huge upset. Uh, Oakland defeated Kentucky. Oakland, California. Uh, and that's what I'm getting at. <laughs> yes. And here's the beauty of it. Everybody's like, man, those kids from California can ball. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think these kids are from California because they're not. They're from, like, Michigan or something. Michigan. Nobody knows where the hell nope. Oakland College is. Going up against the Blue Bloods from Kentucky. And you love it when a team like Kentucky, unless, of course, you're a Wildcat fan, and a coach like Calipari, who you either love or hate. He's one of those guys, kind of the last of the Mohegans when it comes to, you know, big-name coaches like that who uh, have people who have a love affair or can't stand. Watching him get eliminated again in the first round by a 25-year-old Uber driver yeah. is maybe the greatest thing I've seen this week. I think yeah. he drove me to the studio this yeah, morning. Yeah, <laughs> and that's the story. There's a kid on Oakland, I don't even know his name, I'm not going to pretend I do, who, who played five years at the Division II level, mm -hmm. somehow, I don't know how this works, still had eligibility left to play D1. Over years. Put himself into the portal one team. Now, there are 212 Division I uh, programs in this country. One team said, you can come play for us. You're in your mid-20s. And that was Oakland, not in California, in Michigan. And the dude made 10 threes last night. Cooking. And after the game goes, look, I know full well I'm not going to the NBA. But on any given night, I can beat guys who are. I love it so much. I love the idea. It's like, it's, it's like Hoosiers. It yes. like, it's like it's like the the, the rims the same yeah. for them, the balls the same for them, the court's the same for them. It's, we can beat anybody at every given night. Yeah, but it's it's frustrating you're looking at this Kentucky roster, which half of them could play in the NBA, and this one guy's gonna be at a local rec, you know, hooping. Not this, even. This. They said he's a CPA. Yeah, yeah. So it's even bad. But if yeah. you but quickly, if you're John Calipari, how do you acknowledge that you haven't won anything since 2019? Well, I tell him to call the Dallas Cowboys. He's really he's like the college basketball version of the Dallas Cowboys. He's only gotten out of the first round once, like you said, in the yep. last four or five years, whatever it is. He gets all the best talent. Kentucky literally does. And there's two or three NBA players, by the way, yeah. Dillingham being the best on that Tony team. Reeves is the uh, that looks to their NBA first-round picks. But – when you're a bunch of freshmen playing against, you know, 28-year-old Uber drivers who have been around the block a little bit, <laughs> yeah. you know, you could lose. And obviously they lost. Kansas almost lost. Terrible call last night. We'll get to that a little bit later on. And while I'm thinking about it, and obviously all the nonsense yesterday with, you know, Shohei Otani, yeah. Major League Baseball, I'll get more of that a little bit later on. There are days that you wake up when you are a fan of a team that does not win a lot. And you get great joy, at least I do, out of the failures of other people and other franchises and other teams. And that's why I sat my fat ass on the couch yesterday, <laughs> just watching basketball wall to wall for the hope that a team like Kentucky would go down <laughs> in the manner they did. I love that. You're the king of schadenfreude. Yeah, you're the you love it. You're, you're Mr. Schadenfreude. I don't know who that is, but I'm yeah, him. <laughs> you're the ultimate curmudgeon. You, like, not a curmudgeon. I root for bad things to happen to good teams. Because, like, I'm a Syracuse graduate. I have my one championship with Carmelo Anthony as a yeah, freshman. Yeah, and man. I hang on to that you know, with everything I got. And I hate Jim Beheim with the passion of a thousand sons. And we were kind of that team people rooted against. I feel that. Sure. 
but I don't win much. I'm a Jet fan. I'm a Nick fan. I used to be a Met fan. Now I'm a Yankee fan. Hockey's not my thing, but if it was, I'd be a Rangers fan, 1994. Yep. So watching John Calipari and Kentucky lose was awesome last <laughs> night. And I feel like I speak for a good portion of the audience that if you're not a Kentucky grad, you hate Kentucky. And wow, wow, wow to the Rick Patinos and John Calipari's of the world who for 30 years stole all the best talent from every other school in the country and now they're bemoaning the portal and bemoaning the fact that kids are one and done and all that nonsense. Screw you. Let's go Oakland. Where are they from again? Uh, Michigan. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the best part is there are kids in Michigan right now. Michigan sucked this year. They fired their coach for good reason. He sucks too. Who are like, dude, no joke. <laughs> that guy, that guy who just made 10 threes last night drove me to a frat party last yeah. week as an Uber driver. That's a true story. Listen, he's a sober driver. You guys are fine. So I'm you got a shot? We have an issue here on camera. I just want to acknowledge. Your lips are very shiny. You, yeah, went, they, they you went overboard yeah. with the Vaseline. Yeah. And your lips are very red today. I don't know what you two are doing before the show. But oh, I want, what are you saying? I want wait, in bro? on it is all I'm saying. Oh, okay. If we got cherry ices out there, I want some. Well, and, you, you're the meat in this sandwich. And, uh, listen, I'm in. Okay. Hey, we had a great show for you today. <laughs> uh, Kentucky's the Dallas Cowboys of college basketball. Dak Prescott looks like he might hit free agency. And we'll discuss the merits of that and so much more here on a very special Friday program on oh. FS1. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price. Priceline. Good morning and welcome back Woo, to the Cartoon yeah. Show. We have some interesting information about Dak Prescott. Remember, Jerry Jones talked about restructuring his contract. Dak Prescott himself talked about restructuring his contract. Yet here we are, and he has not restructured his contract, meaning he could potentially be playing in the final year of his contract this season. Craig, yeah. very simple question. Could this potentially be Dak Prescott's last year in a Cowboys uniform? Well, the key word there is potentially. The answer is yes. Now, that wouldn't make any sense from a talent standpoint or an attempt to win standpoint because you better replace him with a top 10 quarterback because that's what he is. But as, as we sit here right now today, there's no benefit for the 2024 season. There would be for other seasons down the line, uh, depending on how you did a contract with voidable years and signing bonuses and all that. There is no benefit today for the 2024 season for them now to restructure Dak Prescott's contract because there's no one left to sign. Correct. So as long as you have enough money, and they do, to sign your uh, picks in the upcoming draft in April, you're good. Uh, and it's troubling if you're a Dallas Cowboy fan because you know they have the money. You know they have the ability to restructure Dak's contract. You know full well there is not a quarterback out there as good or better than Dak Prescott where you can say if he walks after next year, we're still good because we can get right. you know Joe Blow, whoever Joe Blow is. And it's frankly offensive if I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan, especially in light of an article that one of the guys uh, produced for me uh, yesterday. I'm just going to read you the headline here real quick. Dallas Cowboys owner Jerry Jones puts another $100 million into Frisco's Comstock Resources, which is uh, some type of oil or gas company, whatever it is, which he owns like 68% of. So he's willing to write a check. He just wrote a check for $100 million. And I know that money is, yo, this money's earmarked for that, and this money's earmarked for that. But the fact that Jerry Jones has refused to spend a nickel, essentially, or write the really big check to extend Dak's contract to allow them to go out there and get better and get better players, the fact that he hasn't done the C.D. Lamb deal yet, yep. there does come a point where if I'm the player, don't call me. I'll play out the last year of my contract and screw you. I'll take my talents elsewhere. And this is mind-boggling to me because everyone else in the division got better on paper, right? Everyone else did something. And you sat back after being embarrassed at home against the Green Bay Packers and promising your fans that you were all in and you've done nothing. And it's not even like we can sit here and go, oh, 
I don't like the moves that they made. I wouldn't have signed this guy. Yeah. I wouldn't have acquired that guy. They did nothing. So it's not even like we're going to be critical of the decision-making that why'd you get a linebacker when you needed a lineman? Why'd you get a tackle when you needed a safety? You know, those types of conversations, which are more objective, yep. you know, from an opinion standpoint, they did nothing. And the status quo br- drops you down. Like, normally status quo is status quo. When everybody else gets better and you do nothing, you drop down by default. And if I'm a Cowboy fan, I'm beside myself, and I start the kind of, you know, I get the bullhorn out, celebrate team, that kind of stuff starts if I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan. Yeah, at the end of the day, you're right, because when you lose your all-pro left tackle and Tyron Smith and you start losing key pieces, you start to think, like, this team, Val, like they were good last year, won't be the same next year. And on top of that, whether you cut – I know there's a lot of rooms. Well, you should trade Dak you cut Dak. Still 55 million against the cap. doesn't matter what you do with him. Overall, when you talk about Dak Prescott, he considers himself probably number two behind Patrick Mahomes, so you can't ask him to take a pay cut. He's already all pro. So what do you do with Dak going forward? You have to deal with him. And him taking $60 million a year, I mean, that's what he feels like he's worth. And Dak has all the leverage in his in his. Process. No trade clause. Uh, he's uh, $60 million bucks against the cap. There aren't a lot of quarterbacks better than him. If he thinks he's second to Mahomes, he's crazy. Right. So let's, you know, let's just acknowledge that. We got that's stupid. They also can't franchise him because that's in his contract. So they are right now playing with fire. And the fire is this. We go into the season and Dak Prescott plays on the final year of a contract. And I have zero control over his future because of the contract I signed him to a number of years ago. Meaning Dak Prescott, if he wants to, and maybe he wants to stay in Dallas, I don't know. But Dak Prescott, regardless of how this year goes, assuming he stays healthy, yep. becomes the number one free agent, arguably, of all time in the history of the NFL. This a is, top ten quarterback in his prime available. This is absolutely head-scratching. Like, we've all covered this league for a long time. It's modus operandi to have a guy with a huge cap hit, your quarterback that you're invested in, you restructure the deal, you spread it out over four years, yeah. you bring the number down, you sign some free agents to help the team. Like, I thought that would happen a month ago. It really felt like it, this is head scratching to me. Like I honestly feel like Jerry Jones might have been sleeping for the last few yeah. weeks. Now the only thing nothing happened. Like, look, I'm a conspiracy theorist. I like trying to figure out, you know, what's the real story and something. What is the story here? Uh, and by the way, there could be a, a side to the story if I'm Dak Prescott. Where, look, I've already made a ton of money. Right. I've made, oh, damn near what, $150, $80 million, whatever it is. I got $60 million coming to me this year. Maybe I'm playing chess and you guys are playing checkers. Mm. And maybe if I'm Dak Prescott, I'm okay not signing. All I got to do is stay healthy. And for the majority of my career, I have stayed healthy. Yeah. I've got the one major leg injury. Right. Outside of that, I've been blessed to stay healthy, right? Yeah. And po- possibly he recognizes if I can get to free agency, I can get pissed and go to a different setting where maybe I've got a better chance to win. That could be on the table also where there could be people, it's certainly possible, whispering sweet nothings in his agency or going, yep. just get him to next February and I promise you we're going to unload the Brinks truck on him. Do you think there's another team out there that's willing to pay for a quarterback that is unsuccessful? Yeah, the, the name is they're called the Denver Broncos. Right away. Yeah, they're owned by the Walton family. You think they're going to do that right the after Cowboys what they did? made offers to extend him and he said no? I don't I, think so. Well, I can't, I so. can't say that happened. I'm just trying to play out – other scenarios where why there's no rationale for why this hasn't gotten done. No, exactly. well, maybe, it makes no it's, sense. Maybe so, so I'm just trying to, I'm not saying this today. I want to be clear about this. I'm suggesting let's try to find other storylines that could make sense of what doesn't make sense. Well, the sense. one that pops in my head is maybe they're just preparing for a rebuild. Maybe they understand right now. They nah, still you're have, an 82-year-old owner. You're not rebuilding. The what only, else are you going to go? You don't have a core right now. I know. Your arch rival is the San Francisco 49ers. The 49ers have a rookie quarterback, Brock Purdy, that took to the NFC Championship and a Super Bowl. Their core is CMC, Debo, I'm with you. Brandon Ayuk, and George Kettle. So right now, they, the way they are structured, they can continue to compete for a Super Bowl. If That's you're right. the Dallas Cowboys, the one bugaboo against you right now is that when it comes to the Niners, you don't have anything for them because you don't have a core. Dad Prescott calls you one fourth of your cap. Right I'm now. with you a hundred percent. You guys are all talking right. Uh, I have a, but I'm trying to find I have a great another for rationale. Great for question it. for you. 
Who do you think has the wandering eye in this? Yeah. Dak Prescott or the Cowboys? Got to be Dak Prescott. You think because so? Because we'll yeah. play it out. Dak Prescott, if he's the wandering eye, like I just told you the Broncos, yeah. they're owned by their wealthiest family in America. So writing that check ain't no big deal, right? So there's a team that would write a big check, in my opinion at least, okay? On the flip side, if you're Jerry Jones, who has allegedly had a wandering eye when it comes to talent that he wants to bring into Dallas, right? You're saying to yourself, okay, Give me the guy that you might be interested in. It doesn't exist, right? right? It's not Trey Lance. <laughs> I know he's on the roster. Baker I Mayfield? You. Right, and he signed up for four more years. Like, if you told me there was a side piece out there, I'd consider it. But there isn't. If I'm Dak Prescott, I've made the generational wealth. My grandkids are good financially. Now i got to make a decision. And if they're not willing to do it now, I'm not willing to do it next year. And this could make next year a very interesting year for the future of the Dallas Cowboys. And I would love to I watch love that. I love drama in Dallas. <laughs> I love drama in it's Dallas. It's going to blow up. Yeah, me it's too. That's up. right. I just, look, good job on that. It sounded like an explosion right there. Yeah, that's all right. Hey, we did it twice. You nice. smell cookies? I, I baked cookies for everybody. Yeah, smell cookies. Yeah. Yes. I, you, know, you know, like when you have a, a coworker comes here and goes, hey, guys, I hate to do this, but... My daughter's got Girl Scout cookies, and you're like, I can't sit over the Samoa. I'll oh, take man. ten boxes. Samoa's the best. Well, then you have the other guy who goes, my son plays soccer, and they want new cleats for all the kids. Can you buy some frozen David's chocolate chunk <laughs> cookies? And you don't think anything of it. So you go, yeah, give me five boxes. And then a month and a half later, the boxes show up. The guy's begging you for the 80 bucks you owe him. And what are you going to do with five boxes of cookies? So I made it for the staff. Let's oh, go. Oh, there you it. go. I made it for the Cookie staff. Cookie Friday here nice. in the car I show. made it for the staff. Yes, uh, definitely. Coming up, we got first the football for you, and we got a shot that made the gamblers on the NCAA tournament uh, jump for joy. We'll walk you through it and explain it to you right after this on FS1. Hey, real quick, so tournament starts. And a lot of people gamble. Yep. That's why March is Responsible Gambling Awareness Month. Because uh, sometimes people get a little out of control. And they bet on teams they can't name a single player on, which is always weird to me. But people do it. I used to do it as well. And yesterday, uh, big game, back and forth, Oregon and South Carolina. Now, Oregon wins the game candidly with a huge second half. But the first half ended with this shot. Let me just show it to you first and tell you why it's so important. Watch this. Three-quarter shot at the buzzer. Oh, hey. Look at that. That's right. Bank it. The bank is open on Thursday. One more time. Good. It counts money. Now, outside of just seeing a kid make a three-quarter lunch shot, oh, that's why was that so important? Well, let me bring in our resident gambler. This is Gambling Mike coming in here, Mike. All right, Mike. Gambling Mike. Let's see you, Mike. Gambling Mike. Mike. That's my guy. Good to see you, Mike. Oh my God, Good to see Mike. Can you uh, pick it, Hans? Uh, apparently, you are you are allowed to wear hoodies on this show. Yeah. Good yeah. to know. Uh, why was that three-quarter shot so important for people like yourself? Well, I'm thinking it's two good defensive-minded teams. I'm Just thinking... get to the point, Mike. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I, I took the first half under. I you took the first half, half under. Yeah. And what, and was, what was the over-under in the first uh, half? 62 and a half. All right, so 62 and a half. So the way I read it, before that kid takes that 65-foot shot, you're going to win your first half bet. Oh, yeah. You've got under 62 and a half, correct? Correct. And that's a three-point basket. And how many points were scored in the first half after that basket got made? Uh, not under 62. 63 yeah. would be the answer. <laughs> yeah. So you went from, I'm going to McDonald's for lunch, mm. right, to, oh, no, I can't eat because you lost on a three-quarter shot, yeah? yeah? Yep, just yeah. like that. And my mouth just dropped as soon as that happened. There you go. Oh. Perhaps first half bets on a game that you know nothing about would not be the smartest thing to do in the future. They're just kids, Craig. That's how it is. Here's Gambling Mike, everyone. Gambling Mike. Gambling Mike. That's my guy. Gambling Mike. Mike. <laughs> uh, and Gambling Mike will be at it again today. Uh, <laughs> with day two. He had, a, he had a system, by the way. What's the system? His system was he just puts 100 bucks blindly on every uh, underdog, underdog on the money line. So if you get a couple wins like yesterday, Oakland, Oakland beating yep. Kentucky, I think they were plus 850, whatever it was. That can cover you know seven or eight losses uh, for teams that are favorites. And I go, all right, if you have a plan, stick to it. This kid had a plan. Did he explain it this morning? And he's buying bursts and bonuses and you know first halves and second halves and being a total lunatic. And you, I'm not paying your rent. I'll tell you that right now. Anyhow, for Be those responsible. of you, responsible. For those of you now, I always say this: whenever you hear the concept. 
of a bad beat, which everyone's familiar with now, a game that you've got locked in and won, some fluky thing happens at the end, and you lose your bet. There's always the flip side to that. He lost the bet. But a lot of people, I'm sure, won the bet right. on that kid making you know, the 65-foot heave. So just chill out and don't make bets on things you know nothing about. Let's get back to football now. A little first in football with David Jacob. First in football, we start with Russell Wilson. He posted a oh, workout yeah. video. Look at him. He's Here moving. we go. He's moving. He's doing something. <laughs> now, I find this kind of cringy, Craig. But do you think that Russell Wilson will be likable again now that he's a Steeler? Yeah. I, for, I mean, he looks great. You know, he's jacked. He's hot. Ha. He's sexy. Uh, he looks Se- like, I mean, he looks like he's in midseason form. Boom. And see, this is the kind of stuff I as a fan love. Because a lot of guys, look, he's won his Super Bowl, went to two Super Bowls. He's made more money than he could ever spend in his lifetime. You figure he's hanging out with Ciara, which isn't bad to look at all day. Yeah, this is what? You know, like Baja Moore in the Bahamas enjoying, you know, the spring yeah. before he's got to get to work. And the fact that he's out there working on his craft, if I'm a Steeler fan, take all the quirkiness, throw it outside, take yeah. the two years in Denver, throw it in the trash. I want that. And I know it's like feeding a fat kid chocolate. No disrespect. Hey, I did whoa, just give you a cookie. Whoa. But the reality is this. If I'm a Steeler fan, much like us as Jet fans last year, yep. and the question mark was, is Aaron Rodgers really all in? Is Aaron going to participate? Is he even practicing? Because he could easily rest on his laurels. Mm-hmm. So could Russell Wilson. Seeing him on what it looks like a high school field in which they're getting ready for a soccer game, <laughs> running through just footwork fundamentals, I'm in love with that. That's like, to me, that's like porn to me. I can't get enough of that. Right. I want more. Well, the thing about Russell Wilson, man, he, he does work his tail off. He lost weight at the end of last season. That's why I think he had a more productive uh, season this season. Overall, man, I think what Russell Wilson, he has to realize, less is more, right? I think the less he says, the less he does that to cause attention to himself and just produce on the field, people will like him. The whole let's ride, doing the corny stuff. People are over that. What just about, win, Russ. What about when he said, here we go? Yeah. Here we go. Now, I will say this. I mean, the, I video, just, the video still come to, uh, say comes something. to us. The video does come to us courtesy of Danger Russ Wilson. So he hasn't given up all the quirkiness. Yeah. But I love that. Like, I told Fox that I'd love to uh, be able to travel the world on behalf of Fox and on their dollar. Like, I want to be the guy catching balls from Russell Wilson. I want to be the like guy. Running route? Yeah, I want to run some routes. Do. I want to talk to him. I want to get to know him. I want to break down, like, what's Russell Wilson A really like? And B, what's really going through his head? He could retire tomorrow with tons of money, a Super Bowl win, a borderline Hall of Fame career, and he's at a high school field. He's moving. I don't think he's moving so like that. Just doing that, footwork drills. You said that to Fox. What, they, what was the reply? Amazingly, they don't return all my calls <laughs> and text messages. What? They don't. I know, Jacoby. Anyhow, I love it. Steeler fans should love it, too. Yeah. Moving on to second in football, Patrick Mahomes was also working out, but he was working out with Who? his receiver. There you go. G. Rice and Marquise Hollywood Brown. He posted some photos you'll see right here. How do you feel about him? Working on dad bod season. Uh, look, again, it's the same thing about Russell Wilson. This is the stuff that turns us on as fans. To know that this guy could clearly rest on his laurels. You know, going for a three-peat now right. as Super Bowl champions. And what's he doing in March? He's in the gym. Right? He's in the gym with the guys. You know, uh, furthering that bond. Getting stronger. Getting ready for an attempt to do something that's never been done before. Now, the knock on it. And there are people out there that knock this stuff is, we don't need to see it. You don't have to print it out. No, I want to see it. Yeah, yeah. I love it. And I know there is, a, there is an argument to be made. Dude, just go work out in private and you know, be a, uh, you know, uh, care about your craft sure. and get better and stay strong. But on the other side, if I got a dude, like for me, it's Aaron Rodgers. I want to see Aaron Rodgers working out. I want him on the field with a trainer. I want to see whatever you do to repair on Achilles or make your legs stronger. Yep. I want him running routes with the guys, you know, throwing routes, I should say, with the guys. I can't get enough of that because it makes me feel good as a fan when I go to make my decision. Am I going to drop 50 bucks on parking and a buck 50 on a ticket and the $10 hot chocolate for my kid and the jersey and that stuff? It makes me feel better. When I support you emotionally and financially, when I know that you give a damn. And seeing Patty Mahomes, much like seeing Russell Wilson, I feel good about that. I want to give you my money. Take it.
Yeah, but that's the twist. When you talk about Aaron Rodgers preparing for the season, he's at an ayahuasca retreat. That doesn't make you that feel makes safe. You that makes you mentally healthy. That makes you oh. insane. Like, okay. I'm okay with Patrick Mahomes looking a little pudgy in the offseason. In fact, I would prefer him seeing in a, in a beach chair with a tall pink colada. He's earned it, right? Yeah. Aaron Rodgers has done nothing thus far. So, for me, everything we see out of Aaron Rodgers is him basking in the sun as if he won a Super Bowl. You just relax, all right? Well, You're gonna, I guarantee there's going to be video – I don't know if he's back. He may already be back. We just don't know it. But whenever he's back from Costa Rica and vomiting on Jordan <laughs> Poyer and whoever else was there finding themselves in a third dimension, whatever the heck it is, I guarantee you we will see videos of him out there on a college campus in California, maybe Let Cal Berkeley, whatever it is, because that seems to fit his politics, and have him out there, you know, throwing balls, running laps, and I can't wait Does, to see do it. Do you think he knows about Jets West? Does he know about the tradition? Oh, about yeah, he knows. He knows. I think he invented it. I think Aaron Rodgers invented the concept of the off-season workout and getting all the guys together to get on the same page. So what I like about this particular story is because Marquise Brown is involved. And they signed him last week. Yep. And, yeah. you know what, and that means that Patrick Mahomes gets on his phone and says, give me Marquise Brown contact information. Wherever you are, I'm going to come see you. Let's get together. I like that. About yeah. It's, listen, that's the stuff that you know, feeds us in the off-season. We want it. We want to see it. We want to know that you care. You deserve to take a break. Yep. Get away. You know, go party for a month. I don't, oh, that's good. Two months. And guys deserve it. To me now, I got the draft coming up in a month. I got mini camps after that. And then two months later, I got training camps for them trying to go for a three-peat. The Steelers trying to you know, win the division for the first time in a couple of years. Man, for a Jet fan, I want to see it. I, I'm getting excited. It's awesome. Yeah. Glad you mentioned the draft because our third down, third in football, involves the draft. We all expect Caleb Williams to be the number one pick for the Chicago Bears. And DJ Moore, the receiver for the Bears, has a new teammate. Keenan Allen. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And he spoke about that, and here's what he had to say. It doesn't really matter to me, you know. I'm. I know we both want. We both talked about how we're just going to compliment each other. So, I'm just looking forward to that. Whoever good, like it might be a race to a thousand, but that's just a friendly competition. But at the end of the day, if we win it, then whoever catches the ball, I don't really care. So like yeah. he was eating during that yeah. interview. Didn't <laughs> yeah. like Caleb slapped. Williams. Coming in as a quarterback, Keenan Allen, DJ Moore, a couple of weapons. What do you expect from the Bears' offense this season? I think the Bears' offense is going to be really, really good. Obviously, it all is dependent on the growth uh, and how long it takes Caleb Williams to get the NFL system and the speed down. But from a talent standpoint, I will not say they're loaded, but they're pretty damn good on paper. Uh, and I would not be shocked, again, if Caleb Williams, I know there's a big debate amongst, you know, draft experts yep. and college football, uh, you know, voices that we respect. Is he the can't miss generational talent? Is he a problem that shouldn't be on blah, 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 blah? For my money, he's the obvious number one choice. Yep. And I, I don't claim to be a quarterback guru or a college football expert. I just know what my eyes tell me. And the kid does everything. And I don't care about his footwork. Because if you want to talk about a guy's footwork, look at Mahomes' footwork, right? When he's on the run making plays. I'd rather have a guy who can make plays and the feet aren't right than a guy that can't make plays and his feet are perfect. So to answer your question... I think they could have 2,000-yard receivers. Remember, really? uh, there was a day when 1,000 yards uh, really meant something. Yes. But today, if you average 60 yards a game, you're a 1,000-yard receiver. Yeah. You never have to have a 100-yard game, and you could have a 1,000 yards. So I think you're talking more like when I look at stats, who's the 1,500-yard receiver? Yo, know, and even with that, you don't have to have a 100-yard you know, game average because of 17 games. I think Chicago – is in a position talent-wise to do what the Houston Texans did last year with a rookie quarterback. So it's apples to apples. Rookie quarterback, young coach, aggressive mindset, average division, not the best division yep. in football. Can they get to double-digit wins? And if you consider the fact that they did win seven games last year, the division did have two teams in the playoffs, the Lions and the Packers. The Vikings take a major step back because they don't have Kirk Cousins, obviously, as the starting quarterback. And maybe you've got an upset Justin Jefferson coming off an injury year as well. There's, I would not be surprised if we're here December 1st talking about how the Chicago Bears have a chance to A, make the playoffs, and B, maybe even win that division. Yeah, but overall, I think when you talk about 
obviously Keenan Allen, you have DJ Moore. I think the biggest acquisition for the Chicago Bears is DeAndre Swift. Yep. Because when you have a quarterback, a young quarterback, he needs a run game to lean on, right? Because you cannot expect a quarterback who's going to the Chicago Bears, who has a knock on being a hero, kind of playing hero ball, you're going to have to calm him down. Because Caleb Williams obviously knows the expectations that are set before him. He has to deliver, and he wants to bring this franchise to the next level. Bringing on DeAndre Swift with a new offensive line, I think the Bears are going to You know somewhere Justin Fields some is telling his friends, like, oh, this is what he's walking into? Did, yeah. you see, did you see what I signed up for when I was drafted yeah. by the Bears? Right. And, they, and then Caleb Williams is going to have this waiting for him? Like, mm-hmm. it's, it's, I think if Justin Fields is talking to his friends, he's saying, look at this clown working out at a high school field, <laughs> throwing routes on air. Yeah, I think that's more like I've already talking about. And one last quick NFL thing. For those of you that do like man-on-man action like I do, the NFL has decided <laughs> what? the tush pushes back next year. No Jason Kelsey, obviously, but the tush push – will not be outlawed. So for guys like me, aces. Can't wait to see them fail. <laughs> more tushy pushy. Yeah, more tushy pushy coming up after the break, they tell me. It works. Uh, also, we've got some uh, some info from our own Ralph Vacchiano on Daniel Jones and his future with the New York Giants. And we've got some hoops coming your way because while we're all talking about the Knicks, rightfully so, and we're all talking about you know the Celtics and Milwaukee in the East, there's another team that thinks they're getting their rock star back. What? And we'll tell you who it is right after this. We have some interesting information about Daniel Jones. He is currently the starting quarterback for the New York Giants. However, our guy, Bacchiano, Ralph has some information. He says, quote, Jones' health does seem to be a big enough issue for the organization that it's impossible to say they still believe that he's their long-term answer at quarterback. Interesting. They have a high pick in the draft. Yeah. They have Daniel Jones. They have Drew Locke. What do you think the future of the quarterback position is for the New York Giants? I can tell you what it isn't. Let me start the conversation that way. It's not Drew Locke, and it's not Daniel Jones. Uh, and there's enough blood in the water, and guys that cover the Giants will tell you that, that they recognize they made a mistake. When not so much a mistake between choosing Danny Jones over Saquon Barkley, the way a lot of people in New York think, they made a mistake in thinking that Daniel Jones, who took a big step forward two seasons ago in leading the New York Giants to that big playoff win on the road in Brian Dable's first year as head coach, the thought was, ha-ha! We do have our franchise quarterback, and they paid him like one. You know, 40 million bucks this year guaranteed for Danny Jones, and the same last year. And then they can get out, obviously, if he's not injured uh, going into next season. But they also know that here's a guy that tore his ACL, and his running part of his game is as good as any quarterback sure. in the league, maybe just shy of Lamar Jackson's, but he's a great scrambler. They have designed runs for him. It's part of his game. That gave him success, number one. And number two, and I think more concerning for them, is that he's had two major neck injuries, which have cost him a lot yeah. of time. Yeah. You know, it's one thing these days to say, yeah, you can recover eight to ten months from a torn ACL and really be just as good because of, you know, technology and medical science today. So I don't think they're that bothered, big picture, about his knee. I know for a fact they're worried to death about him injuring the neck again. Because then you're talking about a career-threatening injury, for sure. And then thirdly, I don't think they think he's very good. Now part of that is, to be fair to Danny Jones, he wasn't surrounded by much talent. And hasn't been since he got into uh, the league. He had Saquon Barkley, but he got hurt a lot. Darren Waller barely played last year. And when he did, had a huge drop in a couple of games down the stretch when they thought maybe we make a little run in December, which was you know crazy to even think that. So I think to answer your question, you know, Ralph is right. They don't have their future quarterback. They walk away from Danny Jones after this year, barring something totally nuts and crazy, which we got two years ago when an unexpected run to the postseason, which I just don't see this yep. year, even though I do think their defense will be better because they have a really badass defensive lineup. having gotten Burns from Carolina, but don't forget they also lost Xavier McKinney, yep. who's their best defensive player you know, at safety. So I do think the defense is better. Offensively, though, you don't have a tight end you can count on. Because Waller still may retire. We don't know what his deal is. Uh, and by his own admission, kind of gets in his head sometimes and has some issues. You don't have a legitimate rock star wide receiver. That guy don't exist on your team. And with all due respect to Singletary, who's a competent running back, he ain't a 1,500-yard guy. So offensively, you're going to have an embattled quarterback 
who's injury prone, playing behind an upgraded offensive line, for sure, I'll give them that. Yep. And they got depth in that offensive line now, too. But if I'm Danny Jones, one Mississippi, he ain't open, <laughs> two Mississippi. I don't know who that guy is. Three Mississippi, <laughs> and I can't run because my knee's not right. I'm in trouble. Yeah. So I, I think the New York Giants uh, are in trouble, and I think Brian Dable's in trouble because as great as year one was for Brian Dable, making it to the playoffs you know, two years ahead of schedule and having that run and winning a playoff game against Minnesota, what happened last year was a problem. A, infighting amongst the coaches, and he's got to own that. B, where's the talent coming from? Yep. And C, there's a guy lurking who will take that job in a minute. And that guy's Bill Belichick, Ooh. who's going to stay away from football, apparently, this entire year, mm -hmm. recharge the batteries, go on a couple random dates in Boston. I read page six the other day <laughs> about him and some random brunette. Like, all of a sudden, the guy's not allowed to date, and it's a big story. Like and if Gable fails, and there's infighting again on the sideline, I'm telling you right now, do not be surprised if Bill Belichick ultimately takes Dable's job. Yeah, James Jones, I've never had more empathy for a quarterback when I saw him under center with a neck roll, right? Like, that's when I, yeah, that's yeah. When I was like, this guy's in a bad spot. But overall, you also got to understand the Giants going into 2025, they're going to have 53, 53 million in cap space. They need that money to build this team up. Yeah. If he gets hurt, that will cost the Giants well, like $47 to me, million. That becomes the bigger question for the New York Giants this season, knowing that if, if uh, Danny Jones is healthy, you can cut him and you're good. Right. Yep. If Danny Jones gets hurt Which he does. and can't pass a physical a year from right now, they've got to eat $20, what is it, two, $23 million against the cap. They can't allow that to happen. So there's going to come a point this year where if the New York Giants feel like we really have no chance of making the postseason. We're going to play Drew Locke solely to keep Danny Jones healthy so that we can cut him. And I'll tell you something else. I think Danny Jones is going to find that the market for his talents is very similar to the market for Justin Fields' talents. Yep, I agree. Backup quarterback. So, really? we yep. all know that the Eastern Conference in the NBA is the Knicks to lose, right? However, we have some new information. What we got? Potentially, Joel Embiid could be returning to the Sixers for a playoff run. Here is Sixers head coach Nick Nurse discussing that possibility. He is on the court. I'm not, I don't want to say daily, but almost every day now where he's on the court doing basketball things. Um, all the checkups have been positive, and we're just trying to, he's kind of in the ramp up phase now. What, like, what can he handle, and when can he start having contact? And so the Sixers are currently in eighth place in the Eastern Conference. Could they make the playoffs and play spoiler to a top team? Uh, I don't think so. And I say that with respect. And it sucks when you lose a guy who is going for his second MVP award. Yeah. He was the best player in basketball when he got hurt. I don't think there's much argument about that when you look at his scoring and, and everything he brings to the table. And Max, he's a rock star. I love watching him play as well. But no, like if you tell me that Joel Embiid, who is, will have missed, what, five months, four months, whatever the yeah. actual number is, of the season, that you expect him to be able to walk on the court having not played NBA basketball for four months and be the guy that we have all you know, gotten used to seeing, an MVP uh, caliber talent? Uh, I, no, the answer is no. Uh, now, doesn't mean he's not busting his ass trying to get back. We all respect that. But if you're a Sixer fan or just a fan of Eastern Conference basketball trying to figure out Yo, is there a team, yo, that could be a spoiler here? Uh, that team would be the Magic. It wouldn't be the 76ers. And by the way, with the Knicks loss to the Nuggets last night, they dropped down to five. The Magic are now four, like Timmy thought might happen a couple days ago. So glad he's not but here. to stick to Philly, since you asked me about Philly, no, the answer is no. Uh, the Sixers are one and done, and I don't know how you could have any expectation that this guy comes back after four months. And this is NBA basketball, yeah. man. This isn't like YMCA league, and you, you know what I mean? This is the NBA. But this is what makes us gods and make you citizens, right? Because we're able to overcome things like that. But overall, when you say we, I mean athletes. And when you say we, hey, that's what I'm saying. 
Athletes. So you and a uh, beat are in the same. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, we're athletes. Go ahead. I'm with compared you. to him. Oh, anyway, uh, <laughs> what I'm saying overall, you're talking about the Sixers 11 and 22 without him, right? They need him, and they're out. They're out to Bias Harris and Covington. And overall, what the Sixers are missing is that impact player. He's averaging 35 a game. How you make that up? You don't. You, can't. you don't. So the Sixers got to figure out. But everything, everything he's done on the court has been non-contact. When you coming off a uh, meniscus tear, you need to contact. See if you can bear down, sure. jump, and embrace yes. whatever's coming. By the way, I'll tell you this, and I have no inside knowledge about this. Um, I don't think you see him this year. I think that this notion of he might come back uh, is just dressing is all it is. He's going to yeah. come back. The problem I think with Joel Embiid is everyone who follows the Sixers closely knows he misses games in almost every playoff series he's in. Yeah. Whether he gets hit in the face, whether he's got a knee problem, like he, he, he just can't stay healthy. And I'd be concerned as a Sixers fan to bring him back with just a week or two to warm up for a playing game. It's just not going to go well even if they make it. Right, right. They're not winning an NBA championship no, this no. year. I'd which is up. another reason why I don't think he's coming back. I respect the fight and the want to come back. Will. I don't see the upside in him playing again this year. And I was told months and months ago that he wasn't going to play. He was a wrap for the year. So you give him credit. Maybe the body's also healing faster than what people thought. Uh, but, you know, the notion that he's going to come back and lead the Sixers yeah. deep into the playoffs. No. It's just, again, Not this is the NBA, man. These are the greatest basketball players on the planet. You can't sit out for four months and, you know, shoot a couple shots shots without contact and tell the world I'm ready to dominate That's not it how ain't works. gonna happen That's not how works. and boohoo for Philly sorry not sorry <laughs> in any event <laughs> we're gonna take sorry. a quick break we'll get to all your headlines and shockingly one of those headlines is the Dallas Cowboys of college basketball taking it on the chin last Whoa. night and then the Dallas Cowboys themselves possibly taking it on the chin with a crazy decision involving that guy right there Dak Prescott after this Now, Dak Prescott has a huge cap hit for the Cowboys, and we all expected him to have his deal extended and restructured so they could open some cap space and sign some free agents. Well, guess what didn't happen? All of that. Now, Dak heads into a contract year with the Cowboys unless they restructure him before the season starts. Craig. Yes. Is it potentially Dak's last year with the Cowboys? 100%. That's absolutely on really? the table right 100%. now. 100%. Really? On the table. And so, play now. Take the name Dak Prescott out of the equation just for a second okay. because, you know, there, there's emotional reactions to Dak Prescott, uh, good and bad, right? If I told you that I've paid my starting quarterback, I don't know, $150 million – and he's had a bunch of really good regular seasons, you know, 12 win seasons. We all view him as a top 10 quarterback, but he's two and five in the postseason. And I take the name Dak Prescott off that. Is that a guy that you believe in to lead your team deep into a future postseason? The answer would be no. You say, well, he's a competent quarterback, and maybe there's other things but that you go can't into it. eliminate his stats. I, I, I want to be clear okay. about this. I got to take the name away from it for a moment to make the to have the conversation, because if I've committed franchise type money, which I have to my quarterback, right? And I gave him $150 million after he broke his leg. And I'm committed to him. And he's the guy and the face of my franchise. But at the end of the day, I don't trust him in January. There comes a point where I, as the owner, might say, I think I've gotten all I can get out of that guy. I've reached my ceiling with that guy. And at that point, I've now got to make the tough decision. Am I going to throw another $150 million at that guy? Am I going to keep him by default for, let's just say, for argument's standpoint, an extra five years of getting that kind of quarterback play? Or am I going to make the hard decision, which is I've gotten all I can possibly get out of that guy quarterback. I got to start figuring out a plan for who's going to succeed him as quarterback. And my gut is, as much as I think Jerry Jones has lost his fastball, and it's not all in the way he claims to be. I also think there's private conversations, very hard conversations in the front office of the Dallas Cowboys between Jerry Jones and his son, Stephen, and whoever else is allowed into that room when they have these conversations, that Dak Prescott is not the future for the Dallas Cowboys. And as much as we all respect Dak, 
We all view him as a top 10 quarterback. And 20 teams in the league would trade their guy for him right now without blinking. The Dallas Cowboys may have said, I got all I can get out of this guy. Two and five in the postseason. And one of those games, one of those wins was against whom? The retired Tom Brady. A 42-year-old Tom Brady on the road, right? So... I think that's possible. Yeah, but at the end of the day, you you also have to ask yourself, you're Jerry Jones. If not Dak, then who? Because if you go into the draft over the last three years, we got a graphic, we throw it up. There's only two quarterbacks that have panned out over the nine, and that's obviously uh, Trevor Lawrence and C.J. Stroud. All these quarterbacks right here have been a bust. So you're not going to go back into the draft and kind of hit and hopefully strike gold and try to get a quarterback that can lead you to a Super Bowl. Yep. If you don't have it on your roster and you damn sure don't have it in the draft coming up in the next three years. Nope. So right now, all you do have is Dak Prescott. And for me, Dak comes with a little bit of asterisk because we talked about this season, him having his most productive season, him being an all-pro. His defense didn't help him out. Uh, at the end of the day, his office line was a shell of themselves, and there was no run game. Yeah, it but was, we're just making excuses for him, right? No, I'm not. I'm just this the reality. When you put on tape, you said it yourself time after time. When it was multiple times with Dak led them in a position to win. Yeah, the defense that failed them. Yeah, but, but, but here's, the, here's the problem. The problem, is, and and look, all that's right. Yes, there are times, and I say this a lot. If my quarterback walks off the field with the lead, he did his job. Sure. Right. Whether regardless of what the stats are, the problem with that is. You know, that's not different than any other quarterback or any other franchise. And when you get to year eight, year nine, year ten, you are what you are. Like, Popeye had it right. I am what I am. And Dak Prescott is a really good quarterback. He's a really good regular season quarterback. But he's one of those guys, circumstance, some of it, of course, his responsibility, that he is not the big money quarterback you are paying him to be. There's a reason in my opinion, that Jerry Jones, who's a very calculating guy, has not redone Dak's deal. To that point, Craig, when I saw this story, and the fact that they have not restructured Dak is baffling to me. I thought it would happen a month ago. It reminded me of something that Jerry Jones said not too long ago. Let's listen to the owner of the Cowboys right, talk about Dak. Dak has done nothing to change my mind of any uh, promise for the future. I think I said in the deal that right. we'd go as far as Dak takes us right. in the playoffs. Remember that? Right. Remember that? We'd you, go as far as Dak takes us. Right. How you feel you and that's how far we went. Oh, right. So Okay, so my point is that doesn't change a thing. Okay. Where we'll go as far as Dak takes us. We'll go right? as far as Dak takes us. Where has Dak taken them so far? That's it. That's why I feel like Jerry Jones has not committed the money to Dak. Uh, this He's is like, that. you didn't take me anywhere, so I'm not going to reward you for he that. He makes the point there, and that's after they already lost to Green Bay. That's January 31st. Yep. He said, look, I told you we'd go as far as Dak took us, and we did. Dak wasn't good enough to take us beyond the Green Bay Packer playoff game in our own building. Look. I may think, you know, his fastball is no longer there, and it's not the same Jerry Jones as we got, you know, 15, 20 years ago, and we could debate that all day and night, doesn't matter. Here's the reality. If Jerry Jones thought that Dak Prescott was his quarterback three years from now, four years from now, five years from now, he would have been signed. Exactly. And that's it. That can't be it's debated. Exactly. Yeah, but you how, how do you it. sign Dak knowing that, one, he's one-fourth against the cap, and you still have to sign C.D. and Michael Parsons? Because he's a quarterback. He's the most important position on the field. You, it also, re- extending him would free up cap space to make the Parsons deal. By the way, CD you're not deciding easier. not to sign Dak Prescott because I also have to pay C.D. Lamb. You're going to sign Dak Prescott because I need a quarterback first, and I can be creative with that deal so that I can sign C.D. It makes C. it easier Lamb. to sign those other players if yeah. you extend Dak, which is why it's so bad. It Look, makes me feel like Jerry Jones doesn't believe in Dak Prescott. There's a lot of teams that will get in line for Dak Prescott. Yes. I want to be clear. This should not be a referendum on Broncos, Dak Prescott. Vikings, yeah, oh, I mean, yeah, it's the, an MVP no joke. Saints. I, I think there's 20 teams right. that right now today, you know, take money out of it for a minute, would trade their guy straight up today even without even blinking. So it's not a referendum on is Dak a franchise quarterback. It's a referendum on – It's a, here's the best way I can put it. It's like a marriage, right? Like you're married to a beautiful woman. Yes, I am. And on the outside it looks like you're the luckiest guy in the world, right? Yep. She dolls up nicely. And in public you're like, boy, what a catch for Willie David Craig, right? But we don't know what goes on when you guys get home. Yeah. And then one day you find out that Halle Berry's getting divorced again. And we're like, how is that possible? She's the most beautiful woman on the planet. Why can't she keep a man? Right. Right? That's kind of what's going on 
with the Dallas Cowboys and Dak Prescott. He's Halle Berry in the regular season. <laughs> and he's, this is a great comparison. He's somebody else. This is a great comparison. Yeah, and he's Della Reese in the postseason. <laughs> That's the only name I can come up with. I'm sorry. Uh, Google it and figure out who it is. She's a very large woman. But not, not neither here nor there. Right. So that's kind of what it is. Like, they know Dak better than anybody. And while there's a lot of teams like, man, I'd love to sleep with Dak Prescott, using the wife reference sure, again. Sure, yes, I understand. Uh, they're done with it. They're done with Dak. I just don't know if they how, weren't done with Dak, they would have signed him. I just don't know how, if you're a quarterback, uh, if you're, excuse me, a Cowboys fan right now, that you look at your roster, and if you, let's say you do let Dak Prescott walk down the yep. road, right, that you now turn to Trey Lance, the biggest question mark no, of all time. I'm, they're, they're, just if they get rid of Dak, it doesn't mean they're going to Trey Lance who's on Who the else roster. Do you have? Who's available next year? There'd be someone else available, a competent veteran quarterback, to bring in. And I'll tell you what, if Dak Prescott – is a free agent next year. He's the New York Giants starting quarterback in 2025, right? I'm just put, I put that out there right now. Are you saying Dak to the Giants Unless, next year? Unless, of Book course, it. J.J. McCarthy's the pick at yeah, six, we'll which doesn't make any sense to me. But we'll see. There you go. And by the way, I thought that was a solid, solid Hall- analogy. The Halle Berry thing I thought was good. Halle Berry. Like, Halle, Halle yeah. Berry can't keep a man. She's married. I think she's engaged right now. For the ninth time. It's not going to last. 57. It's like Pamela Anderson. Are you can't just upset because she, uh, she, uh, she left David Justice? Is that what you still hold it on? Maybe I am. Okay. Just, we, uh, I'm oh, sorry. Right. Right. Moving on. Let's talk about the New York Jets. <laughs> they signed a new left tackle, Tyron Smith. And Tyron Smith described why he was so excited to sign with Gang Green. Here he is. Okay. <laughs> yeah, all the pieces together right now. They're thinking, you know, the final pieces in this offseason uh, to produce, uh, you know, a team that could, you know, could go all the way. Um, you know, I've been, you know, played against Aaron, you know, some, uh, throughout my career a couple times, and um, you know, I know what kind of quarterback he is. I know what he can do. Okay. Yeah. He said they had the pieces to go all the way. Who's Greg. he talking about? And who the, the hell? How, how the hell he knows? He ain't been to no Super Bowl. How do you know he's going to take uh, some oh, all the way? Oh, Willie, already taking shots. I'm just saying. Huh? My point at the end of the day, like I love Tyrus Smith. I think he's an all-world doesn't tackle. Sound like he's it. Top five. Doesn't sound like tackle. it, Willie. But you can't say you have the pieces to win it all when well, you've never been to this big dance. Oh, that doesn't what I got. make sense. Super Bowl champion Willie Colon. Two times. Super, Super, Super Bowl champion. Lost one, one, one. Super that's, besides, <laughs> that's besides the point. My point is at the end of the day, I love Tyron Smith, but his biggest factor. Right now, yeah, he has to stay on the field. Yeah, listen, that's, been, that's the bugaboo with him is that Bottom he gets line. hurt and misses games. But let's not diminish what the man just said. I may want to hear it again, also because I'm trying to figure out who the painting is behind I think him. Biggie Biggie Small. Is that Biggie Small? Small. Yeah. 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 I neither here nor there. Or Paul Look, on campus. Think about what the man said. Yes, he hasn't won a championship, uh, but you guys all know what it takes because you see other teams that do Willie it. Knows what it takes. And you see what they have, right? Willie knows what but it takes. But the fact they that he's now, to be fair, he also said in a different interview. It was one of two teams. He's either staying in Dallas or going to the Jets. There was like a line of teams yep. looking to sign him. And the Jets got him, I think, at a really good number, too, when it comes to what they're paying and what the guaranteed money is there. But the man just came out and said something that you'd have me drug tested for if I ever said it. You say a lot. I things. went I to the Jets you. because the Jets can win it all. Yeah. Shut your mouth. <laughs> That's what Tyron Smith is saying. And when I hear Tyron Smith talk like that, or Mike Williams, who said the same thing yeah. uh, earlier this week, it makes me want to do the rerun dance. I get so happy. Like, you about to hit the rerun? Uh, we, 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 need a, we need a broom? Do you need a broom? I'm you, so happy. Like, uh, I got legitimate pro bowlers, yeah. veteran guys. Yep. Who've been through the battles, household names, yep. we've seen them on Sunday, telling me I chose the Jets because the Jets can win it all. Craig, question, it is, question for you. Woo! Have you noticed a dramatic shift in Willie Cologne's attitude towards this? Yeah, team? he hates the Jets now. Is, I don't happened? hate I the Jets. Why, I tell you what, I tell you what, I don't hate the Jets. Willie does the pregame, postgame, halftime Just show trauma. at a local cable network. Trauma from last season. Uh, here in New York City uh, throughout the season. It's called oh, whatever it is, great. right? Uh, so he's he's ingratiated in the Jet world. He played for the Jets. Yeah. He of course won his Super Bowl with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Correct. But I think guys like Willie and my dear friend Bart Scott, who does the show Love with Bart. Willie every single Sunday, these guys like the Jet failures. Because it lets them go on TV and pick apart the Jets the way I pick I apart watched, a chicken wing. I watched wing. the show. I watched the show. They yeah. did not like it. They, they love like it. They're like, oh, man, the Jets suck. The Jets. No. Da, 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 da. No. That's what you guys do. That's and not true now, at all. I watched the show. And here's the deal. 
Now that the Jets are going to be good, and according to Tyron Smith and Mike Williams, have a chance to win it all, you and Bart lost your You fastball. think by chance, every Sunday, when I'd rather be on my couch with a nice <laughs> tub of nachos and wings and a tall beer, yeah. I support the Jets. I want to watch the circus that they've been year after year. I think year. you do. No, I, I don't. I think you do. No, I don't. It breaks my heart yeah. to see Garrett Wilson and Quentin Williams and all these young studs uh-huh. who are all world talents. After every game, look like the life has been sucked out I of their bodies. I think And I'll tell you I, something I else that happened. Them. i tell you something else that's happened here in the last week or two. As the Steelers have gotten appreciably better, in my yep. opinion, this offseason with the moves that they've made. Yeah. Your true colors are coming out. Why? Because I'm wearing bad. black? Your true colors are coming out. Yeah. You're, you're upset the Jets are going to be good. No, they I want the Jets to be good. No, you don't. It's you know better, why you it's don't? better business for all of them. You know why you don't? Mom, why? Dad, stop fighting. Here's why you don't. Why? Because the Jets stand in the Steelers' way of a Super Bowl, and you won't There's have There's only it. one person that stands in the way and of I'll the Jets winning the Super Bowl. That's Aaron Rodgers. So, and so I'll tell you something What's else. What's that? Guys like you, what? guys who played the sport, I have great respect sure. for. Guys who won Super Bowl yes, championships. But, but. Your true colors are with the Steelers, and you don't want to see the Jets get in their way. And you I re- want to see the Jets win. No, you I don't. I want to see the Jets, That's bad like for you business. Said, win the division. Mm-hmm. I want to see the Jets not be an absolute cancer throughout the whole NFL season. Uh-huh. I want to see this offense go from being dead last uh-huh. to at least top 10. And, and, I want to uh-huh. see improvement. I right? am so tired of Zach Wilson. Yeah. I am so tired of the, the negative headlines that come out of New York in reference to the Jets. Uh-huh. I want a successful Let me ask you a question. What is Willie Colon going to do in a postgame show when the Jets win their seventh straight and have a two-game oh. lead in the East, you're going to sit there going, sorry, Bart, I got nothing to say. Not at the all. The Jets are the best team in football. I'm going to be dancing and prancing. I want the Jets to win. Make me that promise. You're going to dance, dance and prance. And prance. And prance. And prance. Dance dance and, prance. Dance and, prance. and prance. Not right now. You're going to dance and prance. When they win seven straight. When the Jets clinch the AFC East, I want a full-on dance and dancing prance. And done. Dancing. Done. 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 Oh, I yes. love it. I Man, love done. it. Done. it. Moving on to our final headline that involves Major League <laughs> Baseball. Opening day is just around the corner. However, the sport is em- embroiled yeah. in a controversy regarding that man, Shohei Otani. Craig, what do you feel about this controversy heading into opening? Yeah, I think, look, it's really bad for baseball because he's their biggest star and he's the most marketable star in all sports right now. Yo, know, LeBron included, you know, whatever, pick a sport, he's the guy. He's the most popular athlete on the planet now with that $700 million contract. I'm bothered by this for a lot of reasons. Look, a gambling scandal is inevitable in one of the four major sports, if not all of them. And this is what all the sports are afraid of. You know, the questioning the integrity of a sport. Now, he, I know his story has changed, and that's my problem with it. They went from, you know, the interpreter uh, had himself a gambling problem, got in a financial hole, and here's the guy with the financial means to bail a buddy out. That is a sellable story. I can accept that story because, you know, you kind of check all the boxes on it. But as soon as they reverse course on that story and are now claiming that the money was stolen from him and he had no idea that his best friend, a guy he spends eight months out of the year with, 18 hours a day, had stolen money and not a little bit of money where you might not notice, but the tune of four and a half million dollars according to the reports we read, that's troubling for me because it's a major shift from what the original story, which was put out there by the Otani camp. Remember, Otani's camp put the interpreter on display for the media to interview for an hour and a half. That was their idea. Mm. So what I'm concerned about as a baseball fan, as I try to connect the dots on this story, and as a guy who is a compulsive gambler, to be completely transparent and honest about it. Number one, the irrational mind of a compulsive gambler, if you're in a financial hole, is to bet your way out of it. If you're going to bet your way out of it, the irrational thing for you guys to consider, which seems very rational for guys like me, a compulsive gambler, would be to bet my way out of it on something I think I know the best. Mm. In this case, it would make sense to me that that would be wagers on baseball, which we know what that brings to the table, significant problems. The other thing that concerns me is when they reverse course 
I'm trying to figure out why. Why would you go from Otani's just a good friend bailing out an addict, a good friend of his, because he has the financial means to do so, and now do your best to completely distance him from the actions or the alleged actions of the interpreter? My concern, I want to be very clear how I position this. This is my concern looking at this story from a bird's eye view. If the interpreter wagered on baseball, and I want to be very clear, don't know if he did. everyone is saying he didn't, including apparently the bookmaker himself when he was interviewed or interrogated by a federal law investigators. Yep. The claim right now is there are no wagers on baseball, which would be obviously a very good thing for everybody involved. But one of the things I worry about and consider myself uh, you know, as I take stock of this story is if they thought he did bet on baseball, and I want to be clear, not Otani, but the interpreter, I would do everything in my power like they're doing to distance Otani from his actions. And that's my concern that the about face took happen and when it happened to further protect Otani. At the end of the day, Shohei Otani is not going to be suspended. He did nothing that we're aware of that you know is an affront or foul of the law. He's not getting arrested. He didn't break the he's law. He's not being investigated. And he's currently not even being investigated. I know the IRS is now investigating the bookmaker and the interpreter to try to follow the money and all that kind of stuff. But Otani at some point is going to have to speak to the American press because money did go from his account to the account of this alleged bookmaker. And that's not up for debate. That's accepted as fact. The only thing that's up for debate now is, was it stolen from him? Or did he help a buddy out and wire the money to get his buddy out of a jam? Regardless of the end of the story here, Otani's not being suspended. As far as we know, he's done nothing wrong. Right. No one's even accusing him of wagering on non-baseball stuff. So he seems clean for the moment. The problem is that we've all been around long enough to know that when there's this kind of smoke there's parts of this story that we just don't know about that are not going to be good. I can't define what not good is, but it's troubling for baseball. And it's a good wake-up call for basketball, who is knee-deep in gambling more than maybe any other sport, from the commissioner on down, football and hockey as well, that you better get your house in order. And you better make sure, even if you've told these guys a hundred times, tell them another hundred times what the rules of the sport are when it comes to gambling. Gambling being mainstream is ultimately a good thing. It allows people like me to raise their hand and ask for help without feeling weird about, you know, uh, you know kind of the label of being a, a gambler. Yep, yep. And it also brings the potential of bad things to happen. I would make sure every team in every sport, again, reiterates to the guys, guys, don't F around. This will end your career and be bad for everyone involved if you wager on your own sport. And that's the problem right now. Yeah, I, I think you hit it right on, on the head at the end. I, if, if, as a former athlete and to current athletes, just stay away from it. There's too much gray. There's too much things you don't know. Because yep. nobody, no athlete is reading through the rules. Yep. And let me give you an example. I know I'm going to just go another second. I apologize, but it's important. Like, I'm going to use the NFL as an example. Yep. I, I, I did an interview yesterday, and I was trying to walk people through the NFL rules on gambling amongst right. the guys. It's convoluted. I'll give you an example. It is. An NFL employee is not allowed to wager on any sport. Secretary, trainer, coach cannot gamble on any sport. NFL players are allowed to gamble on any sport other than the NFL. But there's even a, a caveat to that. Let's say Willie Colon's a starting left guard for the New York Jets, and he wants to make a wager on an NBA game. Big NBA fan. If he goes to his car, and his car is parked in the Jet parking lot, he gets suspended for the year. Mm -hmm. If he gets in his car and he drives across the street to the local convenience store and he makes the bed there, he's good. So there's minutia to the rules that the unions have agreed to that the players don't listen to. Because yeah. let's be honest, none of us paid attention when they do those meetings. Right. The players are no different than we are. You know, when we have our meetings that have nothing to do with the show and the content of the show, I don't pay attention at all. Like terms and conditions yeah. when you download an And app no one else does like, either. Yeah, click. So if you're asking a bunch of 25-year-old guys with millions of dollars in the bank to listen to the, you know, the accountant that comes in and goes, let me explain to you the rules of gambling. Ain't nobody listening to that? Yeah. So I just think we got to do a better job of making these guys understand what's at risk. And the way to do that 
Guys like me telling our story in locker rooms, which I do in the collegiate level, you know, every other week now on a big college tour about responsible gambling. I would have Calvin Ridley, who lost a year of his NFL life, yeah, yeah, who's yeah. now blessed to have this huge contract yep. with $41 million guaranteed. I want to hear Calvin Ridley yep. in a locker room tell the young guys, look, this is what I did. He was on injured reserve, made a wager, cost him a year of his life, threw a $20 million contract out the window for a $1,000 bet. Let guys like that talk to the guys because they'll respect his voice, and we need to do a better job of it. That being said, let's hope that this uh, event is what we're being told it is and the actions of an unfortunate compulsive gambler who's just dragging big names along with him. If that's all it is, it ain't great, but we dodged the bullet. If it's more than that, we've got ourselves a problem, and that's our reality. Let's take a quick break now. Quick break. Be right back. We'll continue on. Caleb Williams wowed everybody this pro day, but there's still some haters out there. I am not one of them. I will walk you through his expectations in year one in Chicago right after this. But look at this. What Kentucky. Happened? What happened? They're going to make a deep tournament run, right? Oh, yeah. Nope. Oakland, not California, Oakland, Michigan, powered by 10 threes from Jack Golke. Golke! Golke! For three! Got the upset. What does that tell you about the Kentucky program, Craig? Uh, I love this, by the way. There's nothing better than a oh, bunch of like face. JCC, YMCA kind of guys <laughs> taking a court with future first round draft picks of the NBA and beating them. It's like that old Pete Cow Princeton team. Yep. You're going up against legitimate squads and keeping the game tight. I love it. You know, Goal John team. Calipari has seen his better days. He might as well just take his real job on, which is assistant recruiter for the New York Knicks, and just make that his full time job now because they've only got out of the first round once now in, what, the last four or five years? And good – I mean, this is why, while everything around us might be burning and sports is changing and it's not what it used to be, the tournament is still perfect. So even everyone in St. John's who's bitching about, we didn't get in the tournament, (laughs) it's not fair, the selection committee sucks. If I'm a selection committee guy, I'm standing up today going, how you like me now, St. John's? Because Oakland just beat Kentucky, which is why the tournament is so special. And give Coach you know, Meoff uh, a lot of credit for getting those Oakland kids ready to go Coach against Mio? Kentucky. Coach yeah, Coach. Jack, um, here's the deal. You guys got that? <laughs> <laughs> Winner! <laughs> so, the kid. <laughs> I had to do it. Because here's the deal. Nobody knows who the coach is in Oakland. So, yeah. I didn't know Oakland was in Michigan. <laughs> We're right. We don't even know where Oakland is. I have no idea. Let alone who the coach of Oakland is. Um, but here's the deal. So, the kid that made 10 threes Gold last key. night. Golke, Jack Golke, he spoke after the game. Uh, I think you'll enjoy this. This kid's a rock star for the moment. Listen to this from yesterday. Go ahead. As a player, you can't think that way. you got to go out there and you got to think that you have the same talent level as them. I know they have draft picks, and I know I'm not going to the NBA, but uh, I know on any given night I can compete with those type of guys and our team can compete with those type of guys. And that's why I was so confident going into it, and that's why I say we're not a Cinderella because when we play our A game, we're, we can be the best team on the floor. Now, you may remember he was an actor prior to being a basketball player. Eddie Munster was the first role he had oh, uh, on the screen. Gotcha. But here's the kid that you know, was, you know, slayed the dragon yesterday. He spent five seasons at a D2 school. Hillsdale. I'm not sure how you maintain eligibility, but okay, it's the NCAA. He was an Uber driver and a DoorDash delivery guy uh, while he was at Hillsdale. And what he did after five years at Hillsdale, he was a zero-star recruit coming out of high school, no offers, went D2. He entered the portal after his five years at Hillsdale in D2. There's about 212 D1 schools that play basketball. One school, I'm not exaggerating it, the only school that said, come play for us, was Oakland in the same state of Michigan. And then yesterday, the dude drops 10 threes right on the uh, lap of Kentucky. I, I want to see that graphic again upstairs because there's something on that graphic that blows my mind. What's that, Jacob? The last thing, 97.7% of his shots are three-point shots. Yeah. If you're the opposing coach, <laughs> if you're John Calipari, yeah. you just run him off the three-point line. Except You the, would think 
Yes. You could stop that. You would think the athletes on Kentucky could get in that kid's grill and stop him, but that's when a coach gets lazy and doesn't scout the opponent. Oh, it's Oakland? Exactly. It's they Oakland? Did they did no prep. We're good. They did no prep. Uh, right, because that's stat. 97 points. In the, he yeah. took probably three field goals inside the three-point line. Yeah. If you're the opposing coach, that is negligence if you yeah. don't know that. Yeah. How about this? In 30-whatever games that they've played this season, that kid, Jack Keaw, is that how you pronounce it? Golkey. Golkey, whatever the heck it is. Uh, um, that kid right there, that kid who has the job of Goldman Sachs when this Insane. tournament's over, that kid right there has only attempted eight two-point shots this year. He's taken Craig. 355 <laughs> shots, and only eight of them were two-pointers. This is insane. Yeah. It's like that. You, you know there's that D3 school, Grinnell, out in Iowa. Where great they, school. Yeah, great, 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 great school. Football program. Yeah, well, we're getting there. Um, <laughs> they've got the college basketball team that won a game where they only shot three-pointers the entire game, didn't take a single two-point shot or layup. That's what that kid is. Eight two-point attempts what about the entire year. Football program at Grinnell? Football program was on the way back. as a okay. stud running back. Yeah, uh, yeah, coming yeah, back from back. the tournament. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. um, he may have the same last name as me. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah but he, he – I mean, when I saw his face, man, I was like, he looks like a manager at a Buffalo Wild Wings. Like, how is this guy <laughs> – uh, how did this guy just take please. down the blue? Like, the, like Kentucky's <laughs> like the know, cartel here's basketball. Here's the other best thing. Like, if you ever get DoorDash or Uber, uh, you, know, you know who your driver is. Yeah. There's a lot of kids now in Michigan saying, no joke, look, he drove <laughs> yeah, me literally. six months ago. <laughs> that guy was my driver. <laughs> I love it, I love it, I love they're it. They're calling for Calipari's head, and I don't know if they're wrong for that right now. Uh, no, they should be. Yeah. Now, to be fair, he's got $33 million coming his way, Ew. so it's not easy to walk away from $33 million bucks right. from your head coach. And here's the other reality, and this is kind of where college basketball is at right now. You know, all these kids jockeying from one school to another, you know, for opportunities in the portal to go to a better situation, get more playing time, all the one and dones that there are out there. The reality of basketball and the beauty of basketball for guys like us who love basketball is this game. Because any five kids can go on the court in one game and win that game. If they played 100 times, Kentucky beats them 99. 93. But <laughs> yeah. yesterday, was the day. that kid was on fire. They believe um, that they could win, excuse me, and they dethroned the beast, and I love well, it. Well, there was another beast that was almost dethroned, another blue blood. Yeah, who's almost that? Almost went down. That was Kansas. They were yes. playing Stanford. It came down to the last second. Lock now, them, look at this off. position. Look at this. Oh! A one-point game. Ooh. Good block. Hard Good ball. block, right? Good block. Well, the refs called it a foul, and look at that. That wow. cost Stanford the game. Effectively, they could have gotten the ball back. How do you feel about that? I Look, I feel terrible for the kids because they're down one and they have a chance to do what we just saw yep. Oakland do to Kentucky. And that's something you'll tell your grandkids about, right? Uh, and it's unfortunate that the referees had to blow the whistle and take the game out of the kids' hands. That being said, while it's an egregiously bad call and there's no, you know, there's no defending the call by the ref, you also understand why he made the call. Yep. And he made the call because... The kid drops to the ground, and it looks like there might have been some contact. Now, we have the benefit of this behind-the-scenes slow-motion replay, and we get to see all ball. But in the moment right there, it's an easy call for the ref because the defender's coming from behind, and the dude goes down to the ground without any control of his own body. It's unfortunate because it would have been great to see what would Samford have done Yo, know, down one yep. with the rock, 10 seconds to go. They could have beaten Kansas, which would have been awesome. It, it's, the thing about this play, and, and you know, I feel the same way you do. When I watched it live speed, I, I felt like it was a foul. But then sure. when you watch the replay and you see the details. And there's no replay. Yeah, but when I watched it live speed, it looked like a foul. Yeah, now you want to start talking about replays in the last minute of a game, that kind of and stuff. Judgment calls. I mean, whatever, maybe you do, yeah. maybe you don't. Because here's Stanford's the, already, they're yeah. down one. doesn't mean they're going to score. Right, and right. that's the other yeah. thing. A lot of people think, oh, they got screwed. They would have won. No, Still they would have had a shot. Yeah. They would have had a chance to win the game. But we have no idea what would have happened in possession. The thing that sucks for us as fans with no rooting interest in that game is that the kid makes the two free throws. All right, so now it's a three-point game, so you have a chance to tie you know, in the final 10 seconds. But it robbed us as fans of what could have been one of those edge-of-your-seat magical moments that the tournament's all about. So we got robbed of that for sure. Yes. You have another headline or no? It's time for Real Fugazi. Oh, it's time yeah. for Real or oh, Fugazi. Fugazi. No wonder you piped up right just, there. Just yeah. Wait.
You can always tell what it's into. All right, time now for real or for gaze. Let's get right into it. The New York Jets should be AFC's favorites. Is that for real or for gaze? Craig, you're going to like me now. This is for real. That's oh. With Aaron Rodgers and all the acquisitions they just got in the free agency, and especially this team has a chip on the shoulder. They understand with that man on the field, they have a legit shot and they run the division. The rest of the division is shattered right now. Buffalo Bills aren't who they were last year. The Miami Dolphins, who knows what's going to happen with them. And New England Patriots, Ger uh, Gerard Mayo, they're still looking for a quarterback. Look so at you coming away. back around, I'm just saying, man. showing the Jets a little love. Yeah. Like, I'm with you 100%. You know, based on the Bills. Not having the same group. The Dolphins, of course, you know, riddled with injuries and loss of free agents. New England's going to draft a rookie quarterback, and we don't know yeah. what Mayo brings to the table as a head coach Correct. yet. We've never seen it. The New York Jets, just pure talent. Pure talent. The New York Jets are the best That's team in the East. Good. Pass. Let's go to number two. <laughs> <laughs> the Dallas Cowboys offseason has been a complete and utter failure. For, for real, real? Yeah. or for games? I think America knows this is for real. There's no way after watching this Cowboys team lose 12 and 5, undefeated at home, absolutely get embarrassed against Green Bay. And knowing the issues they have on their roster right now, did nothing. To your point, Craig, everybody, all 32 teams somehow got better besides the Dallas Cowboys. And Jerry doesn't have an answer. That's the problem. And they, he doesn't have an answer because Dak has all the leverage. And they can't look in the future nor behind him to kind of uh, replace Dak. So right now they're stuck in limbo and they're trying to figure out what's the future it's, of the Dallas Cowboys. Your actions are so loud I can't hear what you're saying. We heard Micah Parsons say that he needs help on the defensive line. We heard Jerry yep. Jones say he's all in. We heard Dak Prescott say he was going to restructure his contract. None of it happened. No. Nope. Nothing. Nothing. And by the way, C.D. Lamb's going into the last year of his contract right. as well. What are we doing? Right? Michael Parsons is a year away from what going are we into doing? last McCarthy year. McCarthy is up. And a lot of times when people get ready to sell businesses, they streamline the cost of that business to make it a much more pleasant uh, acquisition. So just consider the fact <laughs> that if I was going to sell my business, I'd want to make my finances look a lot better than they are. Oh. How do I do that? Don't commit $180 million to a nine-year quarterback with only two playoff wins who got embarrassed at home against the Green Bay Packers. Just food for thought. Uh, food for thought. That right. the Number three, the Chicago Bears will win the division after they draft Kayla Williams. F -f 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 yeah. For real or Fugazi? This is Fugazi. Oh. Man, it, it's, listen, it bottom line, you're looking at the Detroit Lions and what they were able to do going into the NFC Championship. Listen, if Josh Reno has a pair of hands and uh, Dan Campbell actually go, uh, kicks a field goal, that's a different outcome for the San Francisco 49ers. I think the best team in that division are the Detroit Lions. So, I, no. I think we all agree on that. They're the incumbent. Yes. They get the respect they've earned. But oh, crap. you've crap. now got a bear team of talent and possibly a franchise quarterback. Yeah, I, I don't believe it. No? Yeah, I don't believe it. All right, we got one more before we take a break. It said here, any mammal with nipples can be milked. For real or for gazing? Uh, this is Fugazi, what are you yeah, talking yeah, about? Yeah, what it I, says here. I, I, but I think I got one more for you, Craig. Yeah. What's up? Uh, 80 man over 50 can bench 275? Is that for real or is that no. Fugazi? Let's well, see. I can. What's oh. that? Oh. Man. What is this? <laughs> oh. What is this? Oh. Woo -hoo. Oh. Yeah. Get it up, Craig. Oh, you got to get it to the chest. Woo -hoo. Yeah. By the way, that's two reps at 275, yeah. was albeit, albeit on the Smith machine. So it's not a true 275, but, really but really pa-pa! It also looks like you're pinching a tip right there, too. Oh, that's oh, just my natural okay, state. That's okay. all that is, my I'm natural saying. state. Okay. I'm getting a lot of heat for the bar not coming all the way down. Yeah, it has to hit the nips. All the way hit down. Hit the nips and press out. So you don't, anybody can bitch here. Look at that. Hit Look the at the me. I'm Craig Curtin. That's nothing. You got to hit the nips hit and the get nips. it out. That's what you got to do. If you milk them, I'll hit them. I tell you what I'll do this weekend. I'll hit the nips. Hit, hit the nips. I, and if I can't do it, I'll put that video out as well. That's the one. That's two, it's yes. 275, guys. Like, I'm 39 years old. Show me a 39-year-old who can rack 275. I mean, I warm up with 275. I mean, That's just, as you said earlier, you're an athlete. Yeah, you are. Yeah. There, there you go. go. All right, we got to take a quick break. Uh, someone's fired for sharing that video. Because <laughs> um, that means you got it off my phone, and we have a problem with that. Russell Wilson's practicing, getting ready for the season. Will he have success in Pittsburgh? And how much leeway does he have not to right after this? I got to tell you, today's a very special day in my life. The New York Jets team of 2024 
is the greatest Jets team ever assembled. Daddy, we get to win! Fire I'm that man to... right now. What? I was having a great day until so you two screwed up. <laughs> I, I don't have a lot of dreams, that's what? just one of them. Me dunking on LeBron with my you know, junk in his grill. I, so what happened with you yeah. and LeBron? I was gifted with a brilliant IQ to understand sports. And that, that's called crack cocaine. You shouldn't smoke it. I just want to propose a trade. That is a drug-induced question. That's not even a story. That's not I gotta true. tell you what. I'm start old 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 Cowboys is not new. They haven't done nothing. That's yeah. between me and Willie right, right. there. Yeah. For some reason, I'm very comfortable <laughs> with yeah. my, my junk comfortable in your face. Right. You know how hard that was for me? Uh, we don't have the camera strength to see it. The Milano semen, we're all in. Liquid everywhere. First of all, it shouldn't even be on TV. I'm a big fan of Austin Powers Gold member. Mm. Oh, Lord. That's terrible. <laughs> oh, I miss him, Hardaway. I miss him dearly. Kind of like a rash I had in 93. <laughs> Welcome back to the uh, Card Show. David Jacoby, of course, my main man, Willie Cologne. And you know, it's funny talking about you know Dak Prescott and the Cowboys and other quarterbacks, etc. cetera. Uh, the one guy that I think we have to agree, boys, is all in is Russell Wilson. Here's Jacoby with First in Football. We have some information about the Chicago Bears and Caleb Williams, who will obviously be the number one pick and quarterback for the Bears. But it was Bears leader in the locker room, Jalen Johnson, a cornerback, who had some advice for the young man when he enters the building. Here's what he had to say. You just humble yourself coming in the building. I yeah. feel like it's one of those things where it's like you can't, like you said, you can't bring that Hollywood stuff into the building, especially now with guys who played this game, I feel like at a high level for for consecutive years in the league. We're going to see through, and it's like, nah, that, what you did in college, the, the Hollywood, it's like, nah, that, that, that you got to prove yourself. That stuff like that doesn't matter. <laughs> so, Willie, I'll start with you on this one, being in the locker room. Yeah. How does Caleb Williams balance being humble and confident as the first pick in the first round? You know, it's a fine line. Like I said, 2013 when Geno Smith got in the building, I mean, he was the talk in New York, especially how that his whole draft process went. He, he took go to Geno Smith and his numbers at West Virginia. They're still hold to this day. Overall, when he got there, he started hanging out with Jay-Z. He started walking around the city. He was at the Knicks games. He's at, he started prancing around the city. Overall, people accept the Hollywood attitude and the nature in which you walk when you win games and you produce. When you don't do that, guys are like, shut it up and shut it down, get back to the basics. But overall, this is who uh, Caleb Williams is. He's flashy. He, he loves, does everything off-platform. He's going to extend plays. He's going to make plays. If I'm Johnson at the end of the day, don't push him back. Welcome him. But you can still do it with a little bit of, uh, I guess, uh, big brother love. Let me, let me, I'm going to double down on Willie's uh, Geno Smith story because it's worth telling. So uh, Monday Night Football, New York Jets, Atlanta Falcons, Geno Smith's the starting quarterback. And he single-handedly brings the Jets back, more with his feet than his his arm. But the dude played his ass off, and the New York Jets go on the road, and they beat the Atlanta Falcons, and Geno thought his poop didn't stink after that game. Which is a lot of young guys. I mean, I was at that game. I'll never forget it. We're like, maybe we have a quarterback. And we're thinking Michael Vick, a similar style, in that game, yo. And he acted like his poop didn't stink, and he's hanging out with the celebrities, and yo wants to be a Rock Nation guy and all that kind of stuff. And then fast forward a little bit. And a story, if you don't follow the Jets, you may not know. Geno Smith uh, decided to have a, a charity event, which is great. You should do charity work when you're a professional athlete. You make the kind of money you make yeah. and give back. Well, he was busting a linebacker's balls about the charity event. And the linebacker, long story short, had spent a couple hundred bucks on a flight. Yeah. And the charity event didn't work out. And the guy wanted his money back. He's like, I don't make $10 million. I want my 250 back. And Gino told him in the locker room, essentially, go F yourself. Yeah. And about 10 seconds later, Gino had a broken jaw. Not making it up. It's not hyperbole. I was there. You can speak this story better than I can. Yeah. He got cold cocked in the locker room and went from, I'm a badass, mm. F you, I'm the starting quarterback of the Jets. I'm not giving you your 250 back and wound up with a broken jaw. That's what he's talking about. That's facts. And for any rookie going into the locker room, always start with respect. What you did in college and your reputation does not transfer over. you got to start with respect. There's a lot of guys like Johnson who played this game, been through wars, who've been through bad seasons. They want respect from the door. And that's what always was told to me. Start with Here, respect. And here's the other aspect of what Willie's talking about that I'll try to articulate for you. 
you could you could wear the clothes you want to wear, be all Hollywood, yep. even through the draft. That's your moment. Every guy has their moment. Yo, know, with the, what suit you choose to yep. wear, who's with you, with the family, girlfriends, whatever it might be. The day he walks in to that locker room in Chicago, he is going to be tested with his manhood. No, it's, it's not like a prison thing, right. but he's going to be tested. Guys are going to push the buttons to see what kind of kid he is. Is he the kid that's going to go look for his mommy to cry like he did after a bad loss? Or is he the kid that's going to be a leader of men? And he will be tested from Jump Street by guys like Johnson, who've been in the league, have had success, and are thrilled that they're getting a franchise quarterback, but they also want to set the record straight. This is the expectation in the NFL. We appreciate what you did in college. We're glad we got you, but there's a pecking order in this building, and you have to understand your role and your place. Don't come in with the Oakley sunglasses on. <laughs> Don't drive the $100,000 sports car. Be humble and put in the work. And if they see you put in the work, then it's very easy to get along yeah, and be a in pro, an NFL locker. Right. Like, be a pro. Be on time. To your point, you hit it right on yep. here. Be, uh, being a leader in men is always being on time, being about your business, and handling your business. And also being accessible. If you're a guy that walks out of the locker room like, guys, I'm not taking any calls right now. I'll talk to you. Because right. like, well, who do you think you are? Yep. So to your point, moving forward, I think, Caleb, with everything that comes along with him, all-world talent, just be respectful, be ready to go and deliver. Moving on to a second in football, and that involves Russell Wilson, the new quarterback for the Steelers, was working out during the offseason. Of course, he posted it on Instagram. Craig, there's something unlikable about Russell Wilson. Do you think him being with the Steelers will make him likable? I think this is likable. It's like when we talked about Baker Mayfield like getting in a three-point stance because the coach needed someone to line up in a practice, yep. and he's like, I'm all in. To me, if I'm a Pittsburgh Steeler player <clears throat> who may not have a personal relationship with Russell and has read the same stuff we've read and heard the rumors about how quirky he is and how he's a me, me, me kind of guy, if I see this on social media, I'm in love because that's the only Russell Wilson I want. The guy that in mid-March is putting in the work. And at the end of the day, does Russell Wilson, 15 years into a career, really need to go out there in March and work on the most rudimentary footworking drills? No, he can do it in his sleep. But the fact that he's doing it and putting reps in now, if I'm Mike Tomlin, I love it. Yeah. If I'm the Roonies, I love it. And if I'm a diehard Steeler fan that has said, man, ever since Roethlisberger retired, I don't know if we can win. We don't have a quarterback. And I got to go up against Lamar and Joe Burrow and now Deshaun Watson. Well, now you've got a guy that is as good as all those dudes, at least in his career historically, and a guy with a chip on his shoulder. And I'll tell you what, if it happened, I didn't see it, but I don't remember this video in March last year. Mm, that's I don't, now, no one's ever questioned his work ethic other than maybe year one in Denver yep. when he came across a bit like a prima donna and looked a little thicker. This dude's in great shape. The guns are out, and he's putting in the work. And to me, I know what that's all about. Like, yeah, my name's on the wall, but I don't show up at 655. I put in the work, as you may remember <laughs> from last season. When, oh, I was, oh, yes. when I was at a jet camp. <laughs> look the at jet, this right here. And what happened was the Jets called me, and they said, look, Aaron Rodgers might get hurt. Right? Zach Wilson can't play. Okay. Can you put in the work? Oh. And I put in the work. No, you didn't do it. I put in the work. Three. Then you Not go three for three. three. Bang. Oh, no. Oh, oh, yeah. your boy. I can throw it. I can kick it. I put the work I mean, in. And I've never that, seen Trevor Simeon do that. And that's why I'm so well-respected <laughs> in the Fox Sports family. That's true. Because I put in the work. Much like Russell Wilson. Much like Russell Wilson. So if Fox needs a quarterback, they can call you. If Fox, if Fox ever could put, and by the way, I have a problem with Fox Sports. No, I, yeah, I'm for saying, all people, Craig, you know, I, got, Craig, I got a problem. Craig, I'm saying I got that, bills to pay, Craig. Craig. I'm saying that. Anyway. Whatever you're about to do, don't do it. I'm saying that anyway. Oh, okay. I got a real problem with Fox Sports. All right. If you can't play it, talk it is kind of the rationale of people that talk about sports. Why doesn't Fox Sports have a flag football team? Why don't we have a softball team? We all talk smack all day long about sports, yeah. but we never play sports. True. 
I want a sports team here. That's fair. I want to go up against those old heads at CBS Sports okay. and rub their noses in it. Let's take them. Yeah, okay. let's go. Let's take I want, right. I want all the smoke. I like that fire. All right. Um, okay. It was nice knowing you guys, and I appreciate <laughs> having you had this opportunity to work here. We got cookies and milk at the door. <laughs> yeah. The cookies suck. All right, listen, we got to take a quick break. We'll get, <laughs> fine. we'll get to your headlines and the fact that the college game has passed. John Calabari, bye. Welcome back to the Cardin Show. We have some interesting information regarding the Eastern Conference. Yeah, the Knicks Joel are going to win it. Joel Embiid could be back in no. just two or three weeks. No. Craig, they now sit at the eighth <laughs> spot. Yeah. How could that shake up? These are comes to the playoffs. First off, I don't think he's coming back. This is nonsense, he is. number he one. Is Craig. Okay, okay, it's fine. Well, he either will, he won't be in a couple <laughs> weeks, but it's not going to shake it up at all. You know, the top five are the top five. And that's not going to change other than the order of the top five. Knicks the Knicks, in. of course, get the big loss last night that we predicted against the Nuggets to end a very successful uh, trip out west. And they're a half game out of four. Mm-hmm. They will overtake the Magic. And we, as we start getting healthy with Mitchell Robinson coming back, Ananobi hopefully back within a week with the elbow and the possibility, nothing Randall, guaranteed, Randall, that Julius Randall, Randall comes Randall. back. Look, that's a team you've got to worry about. And as much as you know, we're Nick fans and we hate the Sixers and all that, we have lost out in seeing a great player play. And that's the same story every year with Joel Embiid. When is he going to break down? When's the back going to go? When are the knees going to go? And it's a real shame because he was on pace to have uh, his second consecutive MVP season. Yeah. He was all world. I was playing maybe the best basketball of his career to start off this season. But I ain't worried about the Sixers, and you shouldn't be either. The Knicks will be fine. The Celtics are fine. The Bucks are fine. And give the Magic some love. No. Because they're a top I four team no, right I want to see the Magic in the first round. That 4-5, I hope it stays like yeah, that. Yeah, by the way. I hope it stays I want to like be that. the four in that. But, yes. I, I'd rather get to two or three so I can avoid the exactly. Celtics. That's what oh! What's this? It's what we call the top five at nine. No matter what we're talking about when the clock gets nine o'clock Eastern, we like trained dogs have to go right into oh, 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 oh. That's awesome. We didn't even practice that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, number five. Kentucky letting a 24-year-old Uber driver <laughs> knock down 10 threes Let last night is why the tournament is the greatest sporting event on the planet Earth. Oakland, not Compton, not California, Oakland, Michigan, Michigan. Michigan. takes down the Blue Bloods from Kentucky with a little Yahtzee in your face. Yeah, it wasn't enough. Antonio Reeves had 27 points, and he still couldn't beat the Buffalo Wings manager, Jack uh, Gulke. John Gulke. Jack Gulke, Jack who's Gulke. the rock star of the tournament right now throughout this entire year, has only attempted eight, eight. two-point shots. He's taking 365 shots and only eight two-point shots. It's absolute coaching negligence if you don't run him off the three-point line. And the Wildcats of Kentucky are now one and four in the last uh, four uh, first round oh, of the NCAA tournament. We have a they have now lost to a 14 seed and a 15 seed. And that's awesome. Shocking. Because nobody likes John Calipari. You like him? I like him. You like him. He said nobody a lot likes of players him. The Knicks. Two people like John Calipari. He <laughs> said a lot of players to the Knicks. <laughs> yes, he does. The Pride right. of Moon Township. Number four. Don't let the Knicks loss last night to the Nuggets uh, make you think the Knicks aren't for real. They are for real. They're the five seed right now. They're going to come back home. After a week and a half trip out west, yep. in which they had a great four and one, trip. Greg. Four and one. The Nuggets are the best home team in basketball. And the Knicks are obviously still banged up. We wrote this game off a week finals ago. Finals preview. As a loss. And this will be finals preview. your like NBA that. Finals. Finals preview. I can see night. it. If someone kidnaps Jason Tatum, that's absolutely <laughs> on the table. <laughs> I know a guy. But there's the Knicks you schedule. Got a guy? I got it. And let's be honest the Nets suck, the Pistons suck, the Spurs suck, the Heat suck. The Bulls suck. Everybody sucks. And the Bulls suck. So it's the eighth easiest schedule left uh, over the course of the last two weeks of the season. I see two losses on there. The New York Knicks can get to three. They will be four, worst case scenario. And most likely, as you said, uh, see the Orlando Magic in the first round. Games one and two at Madison Square Garden. Number three. Three. Tyron Smith and Mike Williams, two of the big names at 
the New York Jets signed in free agency, hearing these two guys in consecutive days talk about why they joined the New York Jets, and we don't have to hear it again. I'll tell you why. What do you say? Their words, not mine. We joined the Jets because the Jets have a real shot of winning it all. I have seen the light. <laughs> the Jets are for real. Come on. I love it. It's always good when your injury-prone vets speak highly of the team. That they're good. <laughs> but that's not what I'm saying. What oh, I am saying is it comes down to Aaron Rodgers, right? If Aaron Rodgers delivers like we expect him to deliver, it is not hard, it's not hard to believe that this team could be competing in the AFC. Not today. surprised you're wearing black today. No, you're not, a Steeler fan. You ain't no Jet fan. Love you, Russell. Number two. <laughs> It's out of morbid curiosity with all the Shohei Otani stuff. How do you know the translator's lying? I, I, I'm always curious when the person speaks. Google Translate? Speaks for like 45 yeah. seconds and the translator only speaks for two. Yeah, like, wait, yeah. But like he said a lot yeah, more than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's the, that's the trouble. You can never trust the translator, as we learn now again with this Shohei Otani story. And it reminds me. When the great Nelson Mandela passed away, at his funeral, there was a translator. And that translator has been rebuked by the entire translator community. He was drunk and was translating gibberish oh. at the Mandela funeral. True story. Is and this proves my point. You can't trust the translator. Because I don't know what the hell he's you saying. You never know what you're going to learn on the card and show. Yeah. You just never know. How do you know that? Because that's my job. Oh, to know everything. Is it? Yeah, yeah, it's my job. And finally, number one. This is their greatest weekend of the year for basketball, Ooh. vasectomies, and <laughs> drinking. Yeah. Thank you, NCAA tournament. All right. We have a Where's full day donut? of basketball again today starting just afternoon all the way to midnight tonight. It is the number one week of the year for men to get vasectomies. I'm giving myself one. And we have all the excuses in the world to eat wings and drink beer from noon on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Hold on. Thank you, college basketball. Hold on. I'm starting before noon. Even better. <laughs> Even better. And you've gotten the snip, have you? Well, yes, I have. Yes. Yes, I have. How are we doing? Uh, great. Okay. How would I know? <laughs> <laughs> I always think it goes great. <laughs> Can't speak for other people. Yeah. Right. For sure. me, it's always great. Yeah. yeah, the worst thing for me is I went to Mount Sinai on the Upper East Side of New York to have a vasectomy done, and the doctor and his staff were fans of mine on the radio. And I'm sitting there, hat on, glasses on, you know, behind a highlight magazine, pretending nobody can see me. And I hear this one over the loudspeaker. Um, next up for the vasectomy, Carton, Craig, <laughs> Carton, your vasectomy doctor is here. Uh, lip on in, we're ready for you. I'm like, what about HIPAA rules? Nothing, yeah. nothing. No. Nope. Anyhow, no, I only have four kids. I might have nine. <laughs> If I didn't have that for a second. Wait, All right, we're going to take a quick break. we got much more coming your way. Dak Prescott is going to his final year as the Cowboy quarterback. We'll discuss the merits of that and much more right after this. <laughs> Good morning. Happy Friday. Welcome back to the Carton Show. FS1. Major yeah. League Baseball has a problem. A tiny. And that problem is there is a controversy surrounding Shohei Otani and that man next to him, his interpreter, and some <coughs> potentially gambling violations. Craig, now yeah. you've had some time to think about yeah. this and digest it. How do you feel about what's happening with Otani? I think Otani is going to come out of it clean. <coughs> Excuse me, I was eating popcorn. You okay, buddy, Craig? You okay, buddy? You okay? I think Otani comes out of it clean when it's all said and done. Uh, the, only, the, only, the trouble for Otani would be... Is there tangible evidence of him wagering? As far as we know right now, even the bookmaker's saying he didn't wager. Yep. And number two, uh, it's did he, anyone involved in this scenario wager on baseball? And again, the people involved are claiming that there were wagers on international soccer, NBA, college, college football, football yep. <coughs> et cetera. Pardon me. Um, so I think he'll dodge the bullet, uh, but it brings up the much larger issue of the concern all the leagues have about gambling, especially gambling on one's own sport. So this story isn't dead by a long shot because of who's involved. The face of Major League Baseball uh, and a scandal, <coughs> I apologize, pardon me, involving gambling. Uh, the biggest question you have now is, why did the Otani camp, his PR people, his lawyers, why did they go from he was bailing a buddy out, the interpreter, and helping him out because he has the financial means to do so, 
and his friend admitted he had a gambling problem and got himself in hot water. And there was only one way out, and that was someone writing a check to a bookie, which happens, by the way, every single day of the week. Why would you go from that story to he didn't help him out, he had no idea he was gambling, and the money was stolen from his account? The first story to me, and I don't know which story is accurate, the first story is a more believable story. He's my best friend. Unfortunately, he went down a bad road, got himself in hot water, couldn't get out of it, and now he's really up against it. I can help him out financially. It doesn't hurt my bank account that much because I have 700 million bucks coming my way. And you have to promise me you're never going to gamble again, which every compulsive gambler says. And until they get rehab help and go to GA, they probably gamble again, which is another story, for another day. That story's believable, a friend helping a friend. What's not believable, and it may be true, I want to be clear, mm -hmm. is that the initial idea was show he's a great friend, he's going to help his buddy out and write the check, but now we're going to claim that he had no idea he was gambling and the money was stolen from his account. <coughs> and the reason that story's harder to believe is that it's not as if I got a thousand bucks cash in my draw and you came and took it and I'm tangibly missing an item that was in my draw. Sorry about that, Craig. This is a bank wire. <laughs> and unless these guys had a relationship where he was able to send money and receive money on an account exclusively in Otani's name, which I guess in theory could be the case, yeah. but highly unlikely, uh, I have a problem with the new story. And once you go from the story is black to the story is white within an hour, you're asking us to question the veracity of everything. So, again, it's a bad look. I think Otani survives it. He's done nothing illegal where he's got to worry about the law coming and arresting him. That's not on the table. But it's a bad look for baseball and a bad look for the role gambling now plays in pro sports. Yeah, it's a bad look because it's centering that this is the beginning of the MLB season. Right? When you're talking about America's sport, like this is where you, we take pride and the old folks, if you will, kind of hold this sport in high, re, in high regard. Now you're talking about a gambler's game. Hey, everything knows, comes along. Everybody knows about the Pete Rose story and on and on and on. I feel bad for Otani because we don't know what happened. There's so much gray in this situation. We kind of got to wait and see what really comes into fruition. Overall, man, if you're Rob Manfred, who I know we're going to have here uh, here soon. Um, this is this is rough. This is a rough way to start. Yeah, and let me just say something about baseball. P baseball is unfairly being criticized because as of right now, they announced they are not conducting an investigation into this. And I, I just want to walk you through why they're not. And I spoke with high-level executives at MLB yesterday uh, throughout the day. The reason they're not is that when there is a federal criminal investigation taking place, they reach out to the feds and they ask, is it okay on your side if we conduct our own parallel investigation? And knowing that sometimes there's a great sensitivity to witnesses or people that you want to bring in for questioning, that you don't want someone else doing that if there's a criminal proceeding, a lot of times the feds will say, let us finish our investigation, then have at it do yours. But don't do it at the same time. So Major League Baseball has reached out to the uh, federal investigators that are looking into the actions of this alleged bookmaker, having nothing to do with Otani, but now including Otani and the interpreter. The IRS is now involved more on the interpreter side and the bookmaker side, and baseball will wait their turn. Once the feds are done, you bet your ass baseball will bring all these guys in and interview them and find out what went on to see if there are any other punishments or you know, discipline that they have to hand out. We will see what happens, but this this could not happen at a worse time right. to a worse player. This is the face of the league. This is right before opening day. This is the nightmare that all leagues consider when yeah. they get involved with gambling. The only thing that this is this is my take, no one else's. Based on the reports that I've read, these are best friends. These are guys that spend eight months together, 18 hours a day together. And that friendship is something that everyone was very well aware of. And I was able to hide my gambling from the people I sat next to for 10 years. So for those of you that are out there saying, there's no way that Otani didn't know. I lived it. I did it. I gambled for 18 months at a level that's obscene that I don't want to glorify, sitting next to people who are family to me, and they never had any idea what I was doing from a gambling standpoint. So the notion that Otani would have had to have known is just not factual. Mm. Compulsive gamblers become world-class hiders and liars. 
And I could sit right next to you, as I did for 10 years, with the people I worked with on Radio New York City. And while they knew I liked to gamble, they had no idea how often I was gambling, when I was gambling, where I was gambling. And I was a guy, I had a morning show in New York City, 6 a.m. on the air. And there were many days where at 3.30, I was in a casino an hour away from my studio. They had no idea. And as long as I showed up for work and did my job and got the ratings that I got, no one even questioned why I was tired or why I might be distracted. I did my job. I did my job well. It is not hard for a high-level compulsive gambler to hide what he's doing from the people closest to him. So that narrative has to change. Now, the real question becomes, with all the downtime that baseball players have and the access to gambling, whether it be legal or with an illegal bookmaker, the fact that he might be in a hotel room with a buddy who's rooting on a college basketball game for no reason and not know that he's gambling, that's a legitimate question to ask. Right. There's a chance he had no idea. I hid it from the world for a year and a half. You would have had no idea that I was gambling, and I'm a guy that, I hate to say this, but I got to own it, at midnight was on a helicopter, on a private jet, in a car, going to and from casinos to wager obscene amounts of money on blackjack, and nobody in my life had any idea I was doing it. So that is a narrative that has to change, that Otani would have had to have known it's his best friend. That ain't the case, and we become really good at making sure you guys don't know what we're doing. Uh, it's not a good story. It's a great warning, I think, for all the leagues. My gut is that MLB and Otani dodge a major bullet here. And knock on wood, there's not a single wager on a baseball game. That's the part of the story I have a tough time believing. Because in the irrational mind of a compulsive gambler, which this uh, interpreter has owned up to, he told the team, he addressed the team, and said, I have a problem with gambling, so I'm not speaking out of school here. The irrational mind of a compulsive gambler is, I'm in a bad place. To get out of that bad place, I'm going to bet my way out of it. And if I'm going to bet my way out of a financial problem, I'm going to bet on something I feel like I've got the best chance of winning at. And to me, if you're in a baseball locker room 24-7, unfettered access, and your best friend is Shohei Otani, all right, you're not going to make that money back or get out of that hole by wagering on international soccer or by wagering on, like I did, a dog race in Tijuana which I did at 3 o'clock in the morning to try to get out of a hole one night, right? Mm. You're going to bet on something that you think you know better than anything else. And in this case, that would be baseball. To date, there is no proof, there is no even accusation that the interpreter ever made a single wager on baseball. To the contrary, the investigators are saying he didn't, and the bookmaker apparently is saying that he didn't. Let's hope that's the story. And he kept his gambling to everything other than baseball. And he claimed, apparently, in that interview he did for an hour and a half, that he was well aware that the rules were you cannot bet on baseball if you're employed by a baseball team. He made that point. Now, as a guy who used to gamble a lot, I don't, want to, I don't care what you tell me I can and can't do. If I'm chasing money, I'm going to bet whoever I choose to because I'm chasing money and I'm in a bad headspace. So that'll be the story that has to play out. Did the guy bet on baseball or not? And did anybody know about it? But for now, I think Otani is clean. He will not be suspended. Maybe an error in judgment on who he allowed in his inner circle. That's probably fair to say. But he's not going to be suspended. And he will play baseball this year every game for the L.A. Dodgers. Appreciate that perspective, Craig. Moving on to our second headline, and that involves Dak Prescott. We heard Jerry Jones talk about restructuring his contract. We heard Dak himself say that it would help the team to restructure his contract. However, as we sit right now, he still doesn't have a restructured contact contract, and he has a huge hit against the cap this year, which leads to this question. Is it possible this is the last year that Dak Prescott is a starting quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys? Yeah, I think it's more on the table now than it's ever been. Right? The question in the past was, is he worth it? Is he worth $150, $200 million extension? And the answer was, yeah, he's yeah. a top-ten quarterback. You, know, you have no other options there. But now the question is, they let it get this far. There's no one else of note that you're going to bring in as a free agent that costs all that much money. So you don't have to restructure Dax deal to bring in two or three free agents, which is what most teams trying to win will do. Right. So to me, it seems like the handwriting's on the wall. 
And Jerry Jones has said a million times, we're only as good as Dak Prescott plays. And he made the point on January 31st this past year. Let's listen to it, Craig. Of saying this. Here's Jerry Jones on my birthday talking about Dak Prescott and what he brings to the table and if he can lead the Cowboys to a championship. Go ahead. Dak has done nothing to change my mind of any uh, promise for the future. I think I said in the deal that right. we'd go as far as Dak takes us right. in the playoffs. Remember that? Right. We go as far as Dak takes us. Right. And that's how far we went. Oh, right. So okay. So yeah. my point is that doesn't change a thing. Okay. Where we'll go as far as Dak takes us. And that's exactly where they went. Because Dak Prescott's not a postseason guy. He's a regular season guy. He's not a postseason guy. And you went as far as Dak could take you. Remember, the only change they made to Dak's contract this offseason was the roster bonus, signing bonus, yep. where they cleared up four or five million bucks, you remember, yep. uh, under the cap. That's it. They converted that $5 million roster bonus into the signing bonus. And then they re-signed a backup running back that nobody ever heard of, right? Dowdle. Uh, there you go. I forget the guy's name. That's how good he is. Rico Dowdle. Rico Dowdle. Rico. Uh, he plays basketball for Oakland. He was. Right? Like, I never, I never heard of the guy, right? <laughs> but so I, I think the reality is this. We're not going after any other free agents because they're all gone, yeah. other than like you know lower level players, which don't cost a lot of money. We have enough money under the cap to get all our draft picks signed. This is it. This is a wrap. This is a, we paid you a lot of money to be our franchise quarterback. We're going to pay you $59.5 million bucks this year to be our franchise quarterback. And let's see how you do. Let's see how you do with the prospect being of you're now playing for your future. Because Dak's never been in that spot. They re-signed him when they had to. He's never been a lame duck quarterback financially. He's made a boatload of money. And without saying these words, actions speak louder. And the actions of Jerry Jones are you're going to be a lame duck quarterback contractually. And if you play your ass off, I'll do my best to keep you and give you the bag. And if you don't, bye bye. So, and that's really, reality. I'm going to ask you this question. You have Mike McCarthy going into his final year of contract. Yeah. And now you have potentially Dak Prescott going into his final year of contract. Is this a, a sort of like make it or blow it up year for the Cowboys? Yeah, it is. At the end of the day, they have to produce. And I want to show you something. Listen, Jerry Jones, he may have lost his fastball, but he hasn't lost his passion on trying to win a Super Bowl. Here it goes right here. And uh, it is a reminder, I've been here when it was glory hole days, and I've been here when it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. And so having said that, uh, uh, I want me some glory holes. Yes. Yeah. See, that's, that's important. When right? I first <laughs> got to prison, someone said that <laughs> to me, and I said, yeah. no, I'm not your guy. <laughs> I'm just saying. What was that? He may have lost his fastball, what but he's that? still trying to win a Super Bowl. I want me some glory holes. I hole. want me some glory holes. I've been here in the glory hole days, and I've been here without the glory hole. Right. And I, I want to relive the glory yeah. hole days. Was that that's AI? like 15 years ago. Not was that real. AI? That Sadly, was, not. No, that was Jerry. That is a real quote. That was 12 years That's ago, when you uh, love Jerry Jones. Yeah. That's when Jerry Jones had lost his fastball. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, so. Yeah. The Cowboys are so far away from glory hole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> All right, because I'm, final when I, when I'm just going to say no, this. No. When I hear a guy in football talking about glory holes, yeah. I start thinking about the New Jersey Turnpike and a former – Oh, oh, okay. Let's move on to our final headline yeah. that involves New Jersey and exactly the New about. York <laughs> Jets. Yep. They have a new left tackle, Tyron Smith, and he spoke about why he made My the dude. decision to join this franchise in particular and their potential. Here is left tackle of the Jets, Tyron Smith. They have all the pieces together right now. They're making, you know, the final pieces in this offseason to, to produce, uh, you know, a team that could, you know, could go all the way. Um, you know, I've been, you know, I played against Aaron, you know, throughout my career a couple of times. And, um, you know, I know what kind of quarterback he is. I know what he can do. Yeah. Craig, yeah. So love they have it. a team that can go all the way. Yeah, listen, Tyron Smith, uh, who's been a pro bowler, stud left tackle. Obviously, he's never won a championship, but he's a major upgrade Big time over tackle. Mekhi Becton in the last couple of years here with the New York Jets. And that's, listen, when the guys say it, we got to take it for what it's worth. It's gospel. Like, if I say it as a fan, if you say it about the Bills as a fan, or you say it about the Steelers as a fan, we're fans talking. Yeah. When an active player in the NFL says, I went to this team, fill in the blank, doesn't matter what the team is, because they have a legitimate chance to win a Super Bowl. you got to take that as the gospel. Mike Williams said it. Tyron Smith said it. And, of course, Aaron Rodgers has said it ever since he came here a year ago. The New York Jets... Purely from a position of, 
Is there enough talent on the field to win? That answer is now an unequivocal yes. The question marks now are health, obviously, because Tyron Smith has been hurt. Mike Williams gets hurt. Aaron Rodgers hurt. It's hurt. So that's obviously the big question. Yep. The second question, to be fair, one that Jacoby loves, is can Nathaniel Hackett get the job done? No. As offensive coordinator. <laughs> and we'll find out this year. And then the third question is, is Robert Sala a championship quality head coach? To be fair to Robert, going into year four now, he's never had a quarterback. And he's had every excuse in the world, whether it be injuries yeah. or not having a quarterback. So he gets that, and that's why he gets his last shot to be a winning coach. But this is a franchise with Joe Douglas five years into his general manager job and Robert Sala now going into year four as the head coach. Year four, right? As the, huh? Yeah. yeah year yeah, four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As the head coach, they've never had a winning season. Forget about the playoffs. They've never had a winning season. Huh. Now you have no excuses left. Both your careers are on the line. We gave you the talent. We spent the money. Now you got to so, go win. Let yeah. me just show you something. And really, I want you to look at this. Yeah, yeah. When you talk about Tyron Smith, you played line. Yes. He is, the availability is a problem for him. When you look at his history of when he's been on and off the field, it seems like every single season he's missing games. This is just <laughs> games that he's missed. Right. When you see that, are you yeah. concerned as a Jets fan? Uh, it, it, it's tough. It's tough because in most of those games, uh, most of those you know, what you're looking at, he didn't get hurt on the field. A lot of it happened in practice, right? So and that's, what, that's what's so troubling So here's about the deal. It. I look at that, two things come to mind. One, I don't like the every other thing, all right? That's a problem because that means 2024, 20, we're looking at double-digit games missed if we follow the oh, mathematical the pattern, pattern there. Okay, yeah. so I don't like that. Number two, if you told me right now that Tyron Smith starts 14 games. Take it. Take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take, Take it. it. Yeah. Take it. Yeah. I marry it. But he's gonna be he's gonna be on a veteran discount. He won't practice during the week. He's gonna practice Thursday, Friday, and be ready for Sunday. They're gonna treat him with kid glue. Like I I'll take that. You get all the guys uh with Simpson, 14 games, I'll take it. Williams? I, by the way, Aaron Rodgers, 14 games. I'll take it. Depends on which one. I'll take yeah. it. I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll take it. I want it. Aaron to play. Because don't every forget, game. don't forget. Once you clinch the number one seed, you don't play weekly team. Fair. Is that what we're you, doing? Is that what get, we're doing? You fair. get that game off. Don't forget that, that. Very fair. Don't forget that. Listen, have yourselves a great weekend. We'll be back Monday morning at 7. Enjoy the tournament and enjoy the final games of spring training. Baseball starts for real next week. We'll be all over it. Thank you for watching. Have a blessed weekend. Peace out. Peace.